Okay, live stream is running. Uh, Sergeant Play, can you please start your PC recording? PC recording all set. Thank you. Cloud recording all set. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos for verification purposes. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you'd like to submit testimony, please send via email to landusetestimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is landusetestimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Moya, we are ready to begin. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm joined remotely today by Council Members. I'm going to allow you, Arthur, to name those. Council, council, member, council member Grudenchik uh, and Council Member Caban. Great. Uh, today, we will hold public hearings on an amendment to the special process agreement related to the Coney Island Amusement Park uh, project plan in Brooklyn, the one Wyeth Avenue uh, IBIA proposal, uh, the 79 uh, Key Street rezoning, and the River Ring development, all of which are also in Brooklyn, and rezoning proposals for 160-05 uh, Archer Avenue, Beach 79th Street self-storage, 45-2083rd Street and 31st Street, and Hoyt Avenue, all of which are in Brooklyn. Uh, before, I'm sorry, in Queens. Uh, before we begin, I will uh, first recognize the subcommittee council to review the remote meeting procedures. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, subcommittee uh, council to this subcommittee. Members of the public were asked to testify. Members of the public wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearings. If you wish to testify and have not already registered, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the New York City Council website at www.council.nyc.gov to sign up. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of any of the presentations shown today, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your microphone is on before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit instead of appearing before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. Witnesses are requested to remain in the meeting until excused by the chair as council members may have questions. And with that, Chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda items. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, I now open the public hearing on two pre-considered uh, LU items for the 45-20 83rd Street proposal, which seeks a zoning map and zoning text amendment under ULERP numbers C210041, ZMQ, and N210042, ZRQ, and relating to property and council member Drums District in Queens. Uh, once again, for anyone wishing to testify in this item, if you have not already done so, uh, you must register online, and you may do that now by visiting the council's website at council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Uh, council, please call the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Richard Lobel and Fayon Baton, and I'll ask uh, both panelists to now raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee in an answer to all council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, whenever you're ready to begin, uh, please, uh, you can begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Moya. Uh, um, good morning. Good morning, Council Members. Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel, PC. Uh, I'm joined today with uh, Fan Baton from my office, as well as the applicant team, uh, Kevin Williams and Amber Cartalian from Equity Environmental, uh, Ken Mirosky from um, SBJ Group, as well as uh, uh, Scott Barone and John Silviano from um, Barone Management. Um, if you can load the presentation, please. I'm going to begin with a brief discussion of the zoning actions that are sought today. Um, uh, Kevin and Amber can discuss some of the environmental um, uh, issues surrounding the rezoning. 
uh, and the negative declaration received, and Ken can discuss the architectural aspects of the proposal. So the, this is the 4520 83rd Street rezoning. Next slide. By way of background, uh, this rezoning primarily involves three lots that are part of the um, development site. Um, lot 223 and lot 80 uh, are, are the primary uh, lots affected, uh, as well as additional lots which would allow for consistent boundaries for the rezoning. This is in Queens Community District 4. Um, so the, the rezoning action actually encompasses two proposals. The first is to rezone the project area from M11 to R7A. And the second would be to, of course, provide for a mandatory inclusionary housing district to be mapped uh, on the R7A as is uh, required now pursuant to um, uh, the zoning resolution. The project as would be permitted by this rezoning and text amendment would be to facilitate the development of a new nine story building with roughly 141,000 square feet uh, and approximately 163 dwelling units. Uh, this would also allow for an as of right school at the premises. This is one that was previously approved by special permit of BSA as we can discuss uh, at, uh, as we uh, proceed through the presentation. Next slide. So this is a tax map which shows in more, with more specificity the area of the rezoning. What do we know about uh, the rezoning and the surrounding area? Well, particularly if you look at the dotted area, that's the area to be rezoned from M11. To the north of the site, there is an existing R7A on the remainder of our block. This was rezoned um, back in 2006. Uh, so our M11 on this block really is just a holdover and uh, is kind of an island of M11 in a surrounding uh, sea of residential districts. So you see the R7A to the north and east of the site, including along Broadway, uh, as well as uh, residential districts to the south in the form of R6 and to the west in the form of R6B. So really here, the rezoning would allow for uh, uses that are more within the context of the surrounding area than the existing M11. Next slide. So the next slide demonstrates the land use map. Uh, importantly here, although there's a um, designation of M11, on the eastern portion of the site, uh, there is under construction uh, Renaissance Charter School. This was per per permitted pursuant to uh, a BSA special permit obtained last year. Uh, and so the uh, rezoning to R7A will have the added benefit of allowing that school to be as of right. Uh, and also providing for contextual residential uses adjacent to the school. So it's really seemed to be a good thing for uh, the general area as well as for this block. Next slide. Here you can see the zoning change map. Uh, you can see the oddly proportion M11 currently on the block, and then the rezoning to R7A uh, post zoning change. Um, you can also see that this would even out some of the orders of the existing R7A on the site, um, you know, which would allow for uh, consistent R7A along the entirety of the block. Next slide. So the next slide demonstrates a uh, site photo, uh, which shows the, um, the uh, school at the premises, which is under construction. <clears throat> Excuse me. And with that, um, I actually would uh, defer to Ken for a brief discussion with regards to the architectural aspects of the project. Thank you, Richard. Um, Ken Moraski here with Stephen B. Jacobs Group um, as the architect for the school project and uh, the proposed zoning uh, for the residential building. Next slide. So this um, slide just shows the uh, zoning massing of the proposed residential development adjacent to the school. Uh, school is in blue, residential building in white. We're proposing a nine story building with a cellar, uh, 163 dwelling units uh, with a mix of studio, one bedroom, two bedroom and three bedrooms. Uh, the mix that we proposed is um, more heavy on the uh, one and two bedrooms for the uh, considering the community. Uh, the massings you see here are consistent with the adjacent R7A uh, massings that you see uh, next to our site. And we're proposing a 141,000 square foot residential development. Uh, next slide. This is just a site plan showing the location of our residential development fronting 47th Avenue with the school fronting 83rd Street. 
uh, we're proposing an interior courtyard for light and air and uh, distance between our school and the residential development. Next slide. This is just a zoning section showing the uh, residential building next to the school. We're gonna have uh, our accessory parking, uh, detention tank and bicycle parking below grade with uh, lobby and amenity recreation space for the residential building on the first floor and apartments, dwelling units on the floors above. Uh, next slide. And these are just some illustrations of the proposed development. Uh, this is a view looking down 47th Avenue towards 82nd Street. Uh, Elmhurst Plaza, which is a neighboring development is off to the left. Our building would be composed of like a metal paneling uh, system, large windows to let in light and air. And we have this transitional bulk because we're next to the R6B district, kind of showing how our building would step back up at the upper floors. Uh, next slide. And this is just another view looking down 82nd Street toward our development. Um, once again, showing the step uh, setbacks up at the top. And then next slide. And then I, I'll turn it back over to Rich who can talk more about um, the affordability and um, the project. Thanks, Ken. So um, briefly just touching upon the affordability, of course, we're requesting a text amendment to Appendix F to allow for mandatory inclusionary to be um, imposed on the site. Uh, and this would result in anywhere from 41 to 49 units of affordability, um, either pursuant to option one or option two. Um, the applicant uh, has uh, elected to map option one and option two to allow for greater flexibility within the project area. And so um, depending on the option, we would be averaging either 60 or 80% AMIs in accordance with the um, proposal that you see in front of you. There's also a breakdown between 60% and 80% on the bottom of the screen, as well as 40%, which would be achieved uh, depending on the option. So um, with that, next slide. That concludes the um, bulk of the presentation. Uh, again, we have um, uh, Kevin and Amber from Equity who are available for environmental uh, discussions. But uh, with that, we would uh, ask the uh, chair and the council members if there's any questions. Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, just one quick question here. Uh, the community board had a, a lengthy set of conditions. Uh, could you identify some of their concerns and respond to them as uh, best as you can here today? Sure, so, and I think actually uh, it might be useful to have uh, Kevin and Amber address this. There were some discussions with regards to uh, infrastructure and the ability of the uh, street system, as well as the um, you know, water retention and sewer systems uh, to um, handle the capacity of the additional development here. Um, I would just note that with regards to, to bulk and the actual size of the building, that was not really uh, a general concern given the fact that we are adjacent to our 7 a districts on our block as well as to the east. And also we've got, um, uh, you know, the, the existing r 7 a building to the north of us at eight stories with 140 units. Uh, and, and prior to uh, moving forward to Kevin and Amber, and I would also ask that the slide presentation be reloaded because some of the uh, environmental concerns that were discussed at the community board are on the slides. Um, it's important to note that the R7A that's there now on this block from 2006 precedes mandatory inclusionary housing. So the primary difference in terms of uh, inclusionary housing is that that building that exists to the north of us did not have a requirement, whereas with MIH now, all these R7A districts that are, uh, that are, um, that are being rezoned will carry an MIH requirement. So you know, we're, we're happy to be able to bring that affordability to the area. Um, Kevin, Amber, do you wanna uh, briefly touch on the, um, the sewer and stormwater issues? Uh, sure, I, I, I can start. And then if Amber wants to, to add something, it's Kevin Williams from Equity Environmental. Um, so as folks um, here may know, you know, the seeker analyses, um, there are some, you know, 22 different categories of impact analyses and, and two of them involve storm and sewer. Um, generally those 
sections of seeker and this is probably not satisfying um, you know to the community board members but the project falls well below uh, city environmental quality review standards to evaluate capacity analyses for a combined sewer area um, you know generally you have to get to 500 600 700 units um, in such an area um, to trigger an analysis. Um, so the architect, uh, though, um, has identified and, and deployed um, several measures, as shown on the screen, um, to uh, provide a more sustainable building. And you know, many of these are per you know emerging requirements over the last several years uh, through the Department of Buildings. You know that um, provide for sustainability measures, and obviously a lot of the concerns that have emerged were were related to you know the recent storm that really inundated New York City in multiple areas. This area in particular is not one of those that was heavily impacted in the Queens area, which we know that that was one of the most heavily impacted boroughs of the city in certain areas. Um, having said that, you know, comparing this current site, which is entirely impermeable. Um, you, know, you know, where you have a previous industrial area and a parking lot, you know, the building as designed when compared to a potential M11, such as the paper uh, production facility that was there before, actually, you know, would result in, a, in an improvement, most likely in terms of stormwater management uh, and stormwater capture um, in the area. So I just ask that that be taken into consideration and we're available for additional comments or inquiries regarding uh, capacity issues as required um, by the council. Great, uh, thank you uh, for that. That's uh, all the questions uh, that I have uh, for the panel. Uh, we've been joined uh, by council members Traeger, Borelli and Ayala. Uh, council, do we have any council members with any questions? No, Chair, I see no uh, members with questions. I'll just note that uh, we've also been joined by Council Member Levin. Okay, uh, there being no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 45-20 83rd Street rezoning proposal? We have one member of the public to testify on this item and we will call her now. We are calling on Stacy Gautier, is it? I'm apologize yes. if I mispronounced that. Okay. That's fine. Uh, we'll... That's right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much and, and good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Stacy Gautier. I'm the principal of the Renaissance Charter School in Jackson Heights and the executive director of the Renaissance Charter School to um, the school referred to in this presentation. Um, first, I want to just um, say a public thank you to Chair Moya and to Council Member Drum for all your support um, and for both of our schools for the last many, many years. Um, Renaissance has been around for over 22 years, and Renaissance too is very excited to be coming to our permanent home in September um, 2022. Um, I strongly endorse um, this project because I think that the area will be better served by having housing, um, will continue to um, improve the neighborhood feel over there. It's a wonderful area with a lot of families, um, a big park nearby. Our building is gonna be a beautiful school and we look forward to um, serving the students of District 24. Um, just one other piece, we, we've done a lot of community outreach in District 24 and been very welcome there. And so I think having housing on the other side of this lot um, is really a preferred type of development versus something else that might go. Um, and we will, of course, and the part of the school continue to be um, the great neighbors that we are already in Jackson Heights and look forward to working with everybody in Community School District 24. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you for your testimony. Good to see you, glad you're doing well. Um, Council, do we have any uh, members with questions to the panelists? No, Chair, I see no members with questions. Okay, uh, there being no uh, further questions, the panel is now excused. All right, we'll see if there are any other speakers uh, at this time, Mr. Chair, if there are any other members of the public who wish to testify uh, on the 45-20 83rd Street proposal, please press the raise hand button now. And Chair, we will 
scan the meaning at ease uh, very briefly to confirm. Chair, if you'll allow, I'll just also uh, advise that we've been joined by Councilmember Reynoso and Councilmember Rivera. Thank you. Chair Moya, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU items for the 45-2083rd Street proposal under ULERP numbers C210041ZMQ and N210042ZRQ, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, at this time, we're going to uh, vote on two items previously heard by the subcommittee at our October 25th and November 18th meetings. Uh, we will vote to approve with modifications LU numbers uh, 914 and 915 for the proposed special Brooklyn Navy Yard District relating to property in Council Number 11's district in Brooklyn. The proposal seeks a zoning text and zoning map amendment to establish the new special Brooklyn Navy Yard District. Our modification will be uh, to include periodic reporting requirements relating to uh, Navy Yard tenants. Uh, Council, uh, Council Member 11 is in support of the proposal as modified. We will also vote to approve LUs 925 and 926 um, for the 103-16 uh, Van Wick Expressway rezoning relating to property in Council Member Adams' district in Queens. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to rezone an existing R3A district to an R6B uh, C23 district and a relating and a related zoning text amendment to establish an MIH program area utilizing options one and two. Our modifications will be to strike MIH option two while retaining option one. Council Member Adams is in support of this proposal. Uh, and now I will call for a vote to approve with modifications uh, I have described, LUs 914, 915, 925, and um, 926. Council, if you can please call the roll. Chair Moya. I vote aye. Council Member Levin. I vote aye. Council Member Reynoso. Come back to Council Member Reynoso. Council Member Gordenchik. Aye. Aye. Council Member Ayala. Council Member Ayala. I vote aye. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Council Member Borelli. I vote aye. Council Member Reynoso. Council Member Reynoso on a vote of the land use items. Uh, I vote aye on all. Okay, uh, Chair, uh, by a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, uh, the items are adopted, recommended for approval to the full land use committee. Uh, thank you. And uh, with that, we will return to our public hearings. Uh, and with that, I now open the public hearing on the pre-considered LU item uh, related to the Coney Island uh, Amusement Park project plan for the proposed uh, third amendment to the special process agreement and relating to, to property in Council Member Traeger's district in Brooklyn. Uh, I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website at council.nyc.gov forward land use. Um, Council, if you could, um, please call the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Sean Freyas of EDC, Alessandro Zamperla of uh, CAI, and Dennis Fuderis of Deno's Wonder Wheel Park. I'll ask all panelists to now raise your right hands. Uh, thank you. 
do you swear or affirm uh, that the testimony you are about to give to this uh, subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all council member questions truthfully? I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you may begin. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. Uh, would you mind bringing up my presentation, please? Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Fries, and I am a Vice President of Portfolio Management at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. I am joined by Alessandro Zamperla from Central Amusement International and Dennis Fodoris from Voodoo Food Corp and the operator of Dino's Wonder Wheel. Uh, we are pleased to testify before the subcommittee in support of the resolution to approve the third amendment to the agreement for a special process for New York City Council review and approval of Coney Island Amusement Park Project Plan, otherwise referred to as the special process agreement, which governs the historic Coney Island Amusement District. This amendment would authorize the city to extend its lease with NYC EDC and NYC EDC to extend our ground leases with the operators of the Coney Island Amusement Parks, CEI and Dinos, uh, for an additional 10 year period from 2027 to 2037. As part of this transaction, CEI intends to enter into sublease extensions with current small business boardwalk subtenants, uh, Brooklyn Beach Shop, Half of Foods, One Summer, and Tom's Coney Island for the same 10 year period to 2037. Uh, please note that NYC EDC entering into any ground lease extensions must first be approved by EDC's board of directors and required notice provided in compliance with the requirements of the New York State Public Authorities Law, and EDC must also receive applicable lease extensions from the city. Uh, additionally, the Third Amendment to the Special Process Agreement must be signed by City Council and the Mayor. Uh, next slide, please. So here you can see a map of the Coney Island amusement area, uh, along with a map of Brooklyn to help orient you. Uh, the specific portions that we're discussing today are outlined in green. Um, so CEI, uh, Dinos, and the small businesses at Coney Island have faced disproportionate impacts from the COVID crisis. And you'll hear directly uh, from them about that later. Through this proposed amendment though, to the special process agreement and the resulting ground lease and sublease extensions, the city will do its part to support one of the world's most iconic and urban amusement parks, along with the small businesses that are central to New York City's economic and cultural life. Next slide, please. So let's, uh, let's talk about how we got here. The 2009 Coney Island rezoning set the stage for much of the redevelopment that is taking place in the neighborhood today. Uh, including the preservation and revitalization of the iconic Coney Island amusement area. So first, the 2009 rezoning permitted mixed developments in the Coney Island district. And in the past decade, the city has made significant investments in infrastructure and housing in the Coney Island district, including funding for thousands of units of affordable and mixed income housing, new retail options, and new office space for city programs like the City Human Resources Administration and health and hospitals. Uh, everyone at NYC at EDC would like to thank council member Mark Traeger for his continued support and advocacy for the Coney Island community and this historic amusement area. Uh, second, the 2009 rezoning called for the reactivation of vacant parcels at Coney Island with infill development to support beloved attractions by creating new world-class amusement developments and by strengthening the historic Coney Island amusement area. And as we'll discuss in a moment, today's proposed lease extension will help achieve that goal. Uh, and finally, the 2009 rezoning created the Special Process Agreement, or SPA, uh, that we're here to dis discuss today. Under the SPA, the city and EDC are authorized to enter into leases on land within the Coney Island amusement area. Uh, under the authority granted by the SPA in 2009 and subsequently amended in 2013 and 2018, the city leased property to EDC and EDC entered into ground leases with CAI and Dinos to develop and operate world-class amusements and entertainment attractions in Coney Island. These ground leases are set to expire in 2027. Uh, in the past dozen years, CAI and Dinos have made significant investments to help revitalize Coney Island's amusement area, aided by the council's approval of previous amendments to the SBA. 
2013, the council approved the first amendment to the special process agreement, which facilitated CAI's construction of the Thunderbolt roller coaster, uh, as shown uh, at, in the picture at the top. And in 2018, the council approved the second amendment. This amendment added new vacant properties for development. And you know, you can see a picture of the groundbreaking here on the bottom. And next season, these lots will be the setting for a brand new log room ride, uh, an open ropes course, more dining and entertainment options, and additional public open space to be enjoyed by New Yorkers for years to come. We thank the council for their assistance to enable these crucial investments, which will help to cement Coney Island as the people's playground. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So we are here today to ask for the council's assistance once again by approving the third amendment process agreement to authorize the city and EDC to enter into a 10 year extension of the leases from the city to EDC and from EDC to CAI and Dinos from 2027 to 2037. Uh, again, and here on the bottom is a picture of the Coney Island Boardwalk. Uh, these lease extensions will help support one of the world's most iconic urban amusement parks, its boardwalk, the small businesses and residents who are central to New York City's economic and cultural life. The COVID-19 crisis presented significant challenges for the amusements in the Coney Island amusement area. Typically, more than 5 million people across the Coney Island amusement area helped to uh, sustain the long-standing small businesses deeply embedded in the district's rich cultural history. However, due to the mandated government closure in 2020, uh, Luna Park, their respective subtenants, Dino's Wonder Wheel, and surrounding areas were shut down for 18 months throughout the entire 2020 season resulting in severe financial losses. This proposed lease extension will help CAI, Dinos, and the subtenants recoup losses incurred because of the government closures and will support their continued efforts and investment in the amusement area. To close by approving the third amendment to the special process agreement, the council will ensure that the unique and iconic Coney Island amusement area and community continues to thrive for future generations and it will help the city take one step closer toward a recovery for all. We therefore respectfully request your consideration and approval of the third amendment to the special process agreement. I will now turn the floor over to Alessandro Zamperla from CAI to describe his company's history in Coney Island and their shared and continued investment in this historic amusement area. Thank you. Uh, you may also now take down the presentation deck. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Tremoya, council member, uh, thank you for your time and uh, for your attention. My name is Alessandro Zamperla. I'm the president and CEO of Central Amusement International, Inc. And we are here today to support the council's approval of the third amendment to the special process agreement, which would authorize EDC to extend the interim ground lease with CI. As Sean explained earlier in conjunction with this ground lease, CI will simultaneously extend our subleases with our small business subtenants that, like Luna Park, are critical to the identity of Coney Island. In coordination with EDC and the Parks Department, CI has revitalized the historic amusement district with the development of Luna Park in Coney Island and has operated amusement rides and attraction in the Coney Island amusement district since 2010. In order to fulfill our shared vision of returning Coney Island to its glory days, our small business has invested tens of millions into the development of the Coney Island Amusement District through Luna Park, which benefited our small business community in the amusement district, brought record revenues to the boardwalk businesses, and provided thousands of jobs opportunities to the broader Coney Island community. With 11 years of experience working in Coney Island, we have demonstrated great care for the neighborhood context, not only by recreating a thrilling and affordable amusement park for all ages, but also by strengthening the relationship with our community surrounding Luna Park. A key goal of CI is to hire locally, to create economic opportunities, and to support the growth of a professional ecosystem that benefits the surrounding neighborhood. With this purpose, in 2021, we launched the Luna Park Leadership Academy courses designed to enrich our employees' skill sets for long-term career growth in the hospitality industry. As we continue to invest in the Coney Island Amusement District, we'll continue to work with the City of New York, local organization, 
to provide local hiring programs for Luna Park and to expand and strengthen our relationship with local officials, schools, and community organizations. In addition to hiring locally, CI has been building a strong relationship with the surrounding neighborhood by founding the Coney Island Alliance <clears throat> in 2012 with other key stakeholders to facilitate <clears throat> the collaboration and cooperation amongst the Coney Island business community and the residential community. In 2018, CI developed Donation Day, a day where we provide free entry on rides all day to guests that make a small donation to a local community organization and we help and highlight local Time organizations that support children. Hello? Can you hear me? I hope something. Yes, you can continue. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Donation day, a day where we provide free entry on rides all day to guests that make a small donation to a local community organization, and we help and highlight local organizations that support children from difficult backgrounds. As our neighborhood has been hit very hard by the COVID pandemic, CI partnered with the city of New York to incentivize COVID-19 vaccinations by donating 10,000 wristbands and rides on the Coney Island Cyclone to Vax for NYC. Although nothing could have prepared us for the financial challenges that CI faced due to the COVID-19, as our operation was shut down for 18 months throughout the entire 2020 season, we're thankful to be operating again. 2020, amongst other things, demonstrated how critical the amusements are to the economic ecosystem of Coney Island and South Brooklyn, as our small business subtenants were allowed to operate during the season that Luna Park was closed, but they still suffered severe financial losses. To make matters worse for CI, amusement parks were excluded from critical federal and state aid programs designed to help businesses shattered due to the pandemic. For example, we were not included in the shuttered venue operators grant. Fortunately, as it became clear that outdoor amusement park was one of the safest activities in a COVID context, and when a park in Coliana was allowed to reopen, New Yorkers have been unbelievably supportive. Unfortunately, CI and our small business subtenants will not recuperate the economic losses. However, an extension will provide economic stability while we continue our long-term investment in Coney Island as New York City recovers from the unprecedented pandemic and its devastating effects. As CI continues to invest in the development of Coney Island with our new attraction and environmentally friendly pedestrian plaza slated to open in 2022, Luna Park will create additional 100 jobs for the local community. Despite the severe financial losses due to the pandemic, our commitment to Coney Island has not wavered. We are continuing our long-term investment and this proposed lease extension will help ensure economic stability that will help move the historic amusement district and our small family businesses, CI along with our subtenants, from recovery to resilience. As Sean explained earlier, in conjunction with this ground lease extension, we will simultaneously extend our subleases with our small business subtenants, who are also committed to investing in Coney Island for years to come and are critical to the identity of Coney Island. We thank you for Council for your support, most importantly, Council Member Traeger, and we respectfully request your consideration and approval of the third amendment to the special process agreement. Thank you. Uh, if we could now pass it to Dennis Luderis from Dinos. Okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dennis Luderis, and I am the co-owner, along with my brother Steve, of Dinos Wonder Wheel Amusement Park, home of the, new, the world famous New York City landmark Wonder Wheel. Our parents began their journey in Coney Island in 1966 as operators of a small hot dog stand on the boardwalk. In 1970, they opened another hot dog stand in what was then known as Ward's Kitty Park in the shadow of the Wonder Wheel. A decade later or so, they purchased the Wonder Wheel from its original owner and Dino's Wonder Wheel Park was born. At a time when Coney Island was less than desirable for investment, my family began to rehabilitate and restore the Wonder Wheel. We purchased new rides and restored old ones. In 1989, the Wonder Wheel became an official New York City landmark. We continued to invest and build a family-oriented amusement park. We invited members of the Salton Sea Mission to come on opening day for free and to do a blessing of our rides. 
We had 12 or so families show up that day. But today, that tradition started by my parents over 35 years ago continues. And this past opening day in 2021, over 500 families came to give their blessings and enjoy the rides for free. In 2019, we acquired the adjacent abandoned lot on West 12th Street with plans to expand Dino's. With the help and support of third generation Ruderis boys working at the park, my son Dino's, my nephews DJ and Teddy, we decided to build upon the park's family demographic and seek a unique attraction that would not compete with other Coney Island rides, but would complement them. We traveled to other amusement parks around the country and trade shows to do our research and made the decision to build a brand new family thrill roller coaster on our newly acquired lot right next to the Wonder Wheel, the Phoenix. Then came COVID. What now, we asked each other. Closed for an entire season, which hit us all very hard, both financially and emotionally. This was devastating. We have had rainy seasons and lost holiday weekends in the past, but never an entire summer. We made the decision to do the only thing we knew how to do, what our parents taught us to do, and forged ahead with our plans to build. We borrowed money and leveraged our park to move ahead. We were able to keep our staff and family working and to complete the Phoenix, which opened up this past July 4th weekend. We are here today to support the council's approval of the third amendment to the special process agreement, which would authorize EDC to extend the interim ground lease with Dinos. The COVID-19 crisis presented significant challenges for our businesses. I don't have to tell you guys. We want to continue our long-term investment in Coney Island, and this proposed lease extension will help us do that. I want to thank the New York City Council for their support, and most, important, most importantly, Council Member Traeger. And we respectfully request your consideration and approval of the Third Amendment to the Special Process Agreement, which will help ensure that Coney Island remains one of the world's best amusement districts. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dennis and Alessandro and Sean. Um, I'm Council Member Steve Levin. I'm, I'm uh, filling in for, uh, for Chair Moya for a short period of time here. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Council Member Caban, uh, who's joined us as well. Uh, welcome, Tiffany. And turn it over to uh, Council Member Traeger for questions. Thank you. Uh... Uh, Council Member Levin and uh, Chair Moya and members of the committee. Uh, for over 100 years, the Coney Island Amusement District has been an American icon, a potent symbol for the diversity, freedom, and opportunity offered here. Uh, the lights of Steeple Chase Park uh, were the first thing many immigrants would see as they made their way to Ellis Island. Uh, people of all races, classes, and creeds flocked to Coney Island the Nickel Empire, because anyone could enjoy a day of sun and fun here, uh, as long as they had a nickel for the train uh, fare. Uh, throughout these years, uh, Coney Island has faced many existential uh, threats, from fires to Hurricane Sandy and even Robert Moses. Yet, throughout all that, uh, there was never a summer when the amusement parks in Coney Island weren't open up until 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic forced the closure of amusement parks for the first time uh, since Sea Lion Park opened in 1895. This had devastating consequences, not just for the two amusement parks, Eno's Wonder Wheel Park and Luna Park, uh, but uh, also for the, for the generational family operated small businesses on the boardwalk. You will hear from these businesses today about the devastating impact of these closures. We are not remotely out of the woods. While the parks were able to reopen safely last summer, according to New York City and Co., uh, tourism is not expected to fully recover for several years. With each new variant, there is additional uncertainty about how long it will take us to bounce back. While performing arts venues received dedicated federal aid to help sustain them during their closure, no such aid was offered to the family-run businesses that make Coney Island unique. 
uh, PPP, which while helpful, did not fully cover the losses. And many of the boardwalk small businesses did not ultimately receive restaurant revitalization funding. For the first time in its history, Coney Island is facing an existential threat from which it may not recover. Today, we are considering an item that provides the first step to rebuilding the Coney Island we all know and love. I wanna thank EDC, Sean Fries, Sabrina Whitman, Winthrop Hoyt, Lydia Downing, Rachel Loeb, Karen Lapidus, Ricky, Ricky DaCosta, Roddy Miranda, and Justin Turner for working with me and my office on this issue. Under consideration is a proposal to authorize EDC to extend its lease with Luna Park and Dino's for an additional uh, 10 uh, years to 2037. This lease extension would grant necessary stability and security for these iconic family businesses, both of which have recently committed to making significant improvements to their parks, with Dino's opening the Phoenix roller coaster this summer, which I did take a ride on, pretty thrilling ride, and Luna Park in construction on several uh, new rides. But recovery cannot be for two businesses alone. As part of this, Luna Park has reached agreements with four of its subtenants, Paul's Daughter, Ruby's a Bar and Grill, Tom's Coney Island, and the Brooklyn Beach Shop to offer more sustainable rental terms and lease extensions that run until 2037, coterminous with Luna Park's extension. Many of these family businesses have been in Coney Island for generations. I wanna thank Alessandro, Tracy, Tina, Al, Mike, Matt, Jimmy, Maya, and Dennis for their patient collaborative work to reach these agreements. The Coney Island Amusement District is what it is because you are there and because your families have been there for our community through good times and bad. Having worked so hard to reach six agreements to help six iconic family-run businesses survive and thrive, we must ensure that this process moves forward according to the letter and spirit of these agreements. Unfortunately, because of additional approvals, this process will need to be completed in the next term. I don't need to tell any stakeholder from Coney Island about the challenges of enforcing commitments across administration tra transitions. We have innumerable examples of broken promises from the 2009 rezoning. Today, I will be seeking additional assurances from EDC and CAI that the agreements that we have all worked so hard to reach will be executed. After so much instability caused by the pandemic, we all deserve some security in the knowledge that we have reached agreements that will preserve the Coney Island we all know and love for another generation. I wanna thank Jeff Campagna and Amy Levitan uh, for their assistance, as well as my extraordinary, and I quote, extraordinary chief of staff, Anna Scaife, for her tremendous and tireless work on this issue. I thank Chair Moya and members of, this, of the zoning subcommittee for their time and for their, for their consideration. And with that, Council Member Levin, I, I do just have some questions for uh, both EDC and AI, if that's okay. Sure thing, yep. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, to EDC, um, if the council approves this application, what additional approvals are required for the agreements that EDC has reached with its tenants to move forward? Uh, first, thank you, council member, for such impactful words. Um, I believe the remaining approvals include uh, mayoral approval, um, borough board approval, and EDC board approval. Um, in addition, I, you know, I just want to renote again that we are required uh, uh, to provide notice and compliance with the requirements of the New York State uh, Public Authorities Law. Um, and then also we must receive our respective lease extensions from the city as well. Um, given that uh, the next steps in this process will occur after an administration transition, what assurances can EDC provide to its tenants and their subtenants that these agreements will move forward? Um, thank you. Well, we, we certainly share the same goal to ensure a, a positive path forward. And you know, we fully anticipate that all subleases will be signed prior to the execution of the mass release extensions. Um, and then again, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, our, our EDC board must approve these lease extensions as well. Um, but on, you know, honestly, we wouldn't be here unless we also anticipated that approval. And what is that time frame? Um, I 
honestly don't have that in front of me, uh, a timetable that I could answer specifically right now, but I'm happy to come back uh, and have someone from our office reach out to you with a more specific timetable. I, I would greatly appreciate that because uh, time is certainly of the essence. And will, will EDC commit on the record to only approve the lease extension for its tenants authorized under this action if their tenant Luna Park has signed lease amendments with the four subtenants in accordance with the terms they have mutually agreed to? Um, you know, again, we, we certainly anticipate that all subleases will be signed prior to the execution of the, the master lease extensions. That being said, you know, I think in a, in a practical matter, if one of the subleases was not executed because of you know, problematic actions by CAI, then you know, we, we probably won't extend the ground lease with CAI. On the other hand, if one of the subleases failed to reach final agreement um, because let's say the subtenant pulled out of the deal, for example, or chose not to move forward, um, then we probably will continue with the extension of the ground lease uh, with CAI as we wanna make sure that the other subtenants are also able to recover. You know, again, our, our goal here really is to continue uh, to support the recovery and provide a path forward uh, for long-term investment for, for Dinos, for CAI, and the small businesses through this amendment. Okay, because to be clear, they have reached agreements, and we just want to make sure that that is baked into this because we need a win-win for uh, Luna Park and the critical subtenants. Uh, so I, I have... Uh, question for, for CAI, for Luna Park, for uh, uh, Alessandro. And again, I wanted to state for the record that they have made tremendous investments uh, to the Coney Island community, um, both in terms of their business, uh, hiring local folks, um, many charitable events. Just recently, they, they were at Thanksgiving uh, distribution where we gave up meals to families, and we do appreciate that. And I think it's not a secret that we are uh, striving towards an agreement that is a win-win for Luna Park and, and for and for the subtenants that have worked in good faith, really, to strike agreements with Luna Park. So question for uh, Alessandro is, are you, and this is an important one, certainly for my office, for me, uh, are you willing to concretize the term sheets which you have signed with the four subtenants in the form of leases with a, with a condition precedent clause which will only bind you to those terms if you receive your lease extension from EDC? And will you commit to doing so before this council's final stated meeting on December 16th? Good morning, Council Member Trigger, and thank you so much for, for your support. And um, you mentioned you know, a couple of times, this is a win-win approach. That's what we want. You know, we want really to ensure the stability, uh, the recovery and the resilience of, of Coney Island and the museum district. Uh, we have uh, executed term sheets uh, with the subtenants, and uh, we realize how important it is to uh, achieve, you know, and to make progress to the point that we already asked our attorneys to draft, you know, to start drafting uh, the, um, the subleases, and we'll make, you know, our best to, to, to continue to make progress. And as, you know, um, Sean mentioned, uh, that will be a condition, you know, uh, for us to receive our lease extension. Um, so just to be clear, you are willing to concretize the term sheets, which you've already signed with the four subtenants in the form of the leases, right? That's something that you are committed to doing, right, Alessandro? We want, yeah, uh, like it's part again, so it, it is a win-win uh, you know, um, transaction where we want to ensure that the subtenants that have always shown extreme commitment, investment in Coney Island, uh, they are you know, supported so they can not only recover, but again, be resilient. So, uh, those uh, you know, term sheets, those will right. be the terms of the sublease amendments that will be executed. And uh, uh, as a, uh, obviously the con uh, condition president, we'll have to receive our uh, lease extension from EDC. Right, because the, the, the term sheets are not binding. Leases, signed leases are binding. Um, and are you committing to get this done before the vote on December 16th? We, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, I want to also be, be very honest, today's December 2nd, there are like, you know, multiple parties, so we'll do our best. As I said, on our end, we already asked our attorneys to draft um, this of these amendments. Okay, just making clear, Alessandro, and I appreciate that. It just made very crystal clear that that is critically important for us, because in order 
for it's the win-win. We just need, need to make sure that we have signed agreements. Um, okay, last last thing I'll say here, and I understand that in addition to these four generationally family-owned small businesses with whom you have reached agreements and Nathan's, you have one whole, uh, well, I, I'm just making sure that I have everything here, here correct, Alessandro, as far as the, the time frame. I'll follow up with you and your in your team afterwards. Um, we'll we have more work to do on this front. And again, I, I thank everyone for, for their time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Traeger, um, and thank you to Councilmember Levin for uh, stepping in. Uh, Council, do we have any other members uh, who have questions for this panel? <clears throat> no, Chair. I see no other members with questions for the panel. Okay. Um, seeing that there are no uh, more questions for this panel, the witness panel is uh, now excused. Uh, Council, if you could uh, please call up the next panel. The first uh, public witness panel will include Jimmy Kokotas, Maya Haddad Miller. Michael Serrell and Tina Georgiulakos. Uh, apologies for any mispronunciation there. Jimmy, Maya, Michael, and Tina, if you have not already done so, please accept uh, promotion to panelist and please also accept any invitation to unmute. Uh, and, and with that, we will now hear from the panel beginning with Jimmy and then uh, Jimmy Kokotas and then Maya Haddad Miller. Time starts now. Mr. Kokotas, if you can hear me, I need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. Okay, we're good? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to the council. Thank you to the committee and to the subcommittee for the opportunity today to speak on this uh, very important matter. My name is Jimmy Kokotas. I am the third generation owner of Tom's Restaurant of Prospect Heights. In 2012, uh, after negotiations and talks with CAI, we were able to bring uh, a family-run, uh, sit-down, family-friendly business to the Coney Island Boardwalk, uh, which was not there for the last 50 or 60 years prior to us arriving. Uh, there's been plenty of fast food amusements and other different types of food options, but never a sit-down restaurant that would be friendly to young children, to older adults, uh, and to anybody else where they could sit down inside, climate control, with, uh, private bathrooms, and things of that nature. Uh, we were very happy to bring that to the amusement area. Uh, we had a very good run through those years. We were active in the community, working with our local schools, working with the different volunteer groups in Coney Island, and we were proud to participate, host Christmas parties, Thanksgiving parties for the children, and, and again, be active members of the community, the broader community of Coney Island. Uh, things were challenging through the years. It's tough to be a sit-down business on the boardwalk through the inclement weather of the winter. Uh, but we were able to do it. We used to stay open for probably around 300 days of the year. So even tourists that came to Coney Island were able to find something open on the boardwalk, uh, place to sit down, place to get something to eat. With COVID, obviously everything changed. Uh, our business was down approximately 93% in 2020 uh, and approximately 75, 80% in 2021. We were fortunate enough to get the PPP loans, the restaurant revitalization fund uh, funds as well. Uh, and without those, we would not have been able to even make it to this point in the uh, in the discussion. Uh, we speak in, in favor of this of this uh, proposal uh, for CAI so that they can in turn extend our leases, which will add some stability and at least going forward, give us an opportunity to survive. Um, we've taken loans out on the Time business. Expired. We've taken loans out on our business, uh, and again, giving us the extension here in the additional years, and CAI uh, making some concessions thank and lowering our rents for the future thank you years for your testimony today. Uh, helps we really us. Appreciate it. So, thank you. Thank you. Very thank you. Maya Haddad, Maya Haddad Miller will be the next speaker, and uh, for Michael and Tina, if you can hear me, please accept uh, the promotion to panelist uh, and stand by for your testimony. And now we'll hear from Maya Haddad Miller. Time starts now. Good morning. Uh, hi, my name is Maya Haddad Miller, and I own and operate Brooklyn Beach Shop on the Coney Island Boardwalk with my dad, Haim Haddad. 
25 years ago in 96, my dad opened uh, a discount store on the corner of Mermaid and Stillwell where McDonald's stands today. By 2003, it went out of business. That same year, he opened Coney Island Beach up right next door to the original Nathan's famous location. By the summer of 2012, we opened Brooklyn Beach up on the boardwalk. That same year, Hurricane Sandy flooded his shop off the boardwalk and everything inside was destroyed. He had no flood insurance, but we built back. By 2019, our family had six retail shops within the amusement district, but in 2020, only two were able to open. And those two shops ended down 80% to 2019. Lately, one of our biggest challenges has been rent. Our current rental terms are not suited for the environment we are in. As you may or may not know, most boardwalk subtenants signed lease renewals right before the pandemic. I signed mine on March 17, 2020, a day after I closed my doors for the pandemic. These new leases are based on revenues projections from 2019, which in the current environment, as you know, are not sustainable. If you recall, there was very little protection for boardwalk subtenants in the original underlying leases between EDC and right operator. But this extension addresses some of those concerns, at least through to 2037. It would bring my family and some of my neighbors stability during these unstable times, and it will better prepare us for the new normal. The new normal requires realistic rental terms that can accommodate a slow recovery in an, in an unpredictable future. Uh, more specifically, I have signed a term sheet with CAI summarizing the principal terms of a proposed amendment to my existing sublease, as previously mentioned. Um, will it protect me from an, an, another year like 2020? Time expired. Uh, not entirely, but I support this uh, because it will put me in a much better position to bounce back and it offers me stability. So I, my Thank time you. ran out. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Thank next you. speaker, please. Tina Georgia Lacus. Uh, and if you can hear me, Tina, please accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. Time starts now. Tina Georgia Lacus. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to thank Mark Traeger and his staff for their tremendous support during the last two years. Uh, knowing how much you cared about Coney Island and our businesses helped me navigate through this crazy time. Uh, hi, my name is Tina Georgilakos. I'm the owner of Paul's Daughter and uh, Paul's Daughter Restaurant on the Coney Island Boardwalk, and, and I am Paul's Daughter. Uh, my family has been in continuous operation since 1962. My dad started uh, working in Coney Island almost since the day uh, he immigrated from Greece in 1946. Uh, he built this business from nothing and turned it into the iconic place that it is today. Sadly, he passed away two years ago. He was a beloved member of the community and a friend to all, and his devotion to Coney Island is legendary. There's nothing he loved more. I worked there since I was a kid. Uh, he asked me to help him 25 years ago, just one summer, and one summer turned into 25 years later. Um, I've seen all kinds of things happen in the last 60, mm -hmm. 70 years that my dad was on the boardwalk. Um, hurricanes, Sandy, uh, gangs, uh, up and down summers, uh, down 30, 2003, it rained every weekend. Um, it was unbelievable. It was just a terrific, uh, the business was down 30%, but I've never encountered anything like this. Our business was down 80%. Um, this lease extension is our lifeline. Um, we won't make it uh, another, another summer. So um, we need it. I'm in support of it. I had a whole list of things I was gonna say, but everybody's kind of covered everything. So I give my support for this lease extension. And thank you so much to- Thank you, everybody. Tina. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Uh, Michael Serrell, if you can hear me, Michael Serrell, uh, you are being called to testify. Uh, and if you can hear me, we need you to accept the promotion invitation to panelists in order to begin your testimony. Time Michael starts Serrell. now. Michael Serrell, if you can hear me and you are on a 
telephone, uh, you can unmute yourself by pressing star six on your keypad. Star six to unmute yourself on a phone. Once again, it's for Michael Serrell. Michael Serrell, if you can hear me, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. And you can do that on a phone by pressing star six on your keypad. Okay, okay Chair, uh, apologies. Yeah, yeah we will uh, attempt to come back, uh, but we will now call the next panel, uh, which should include Alexandra, uh, excuse me, Alexandra Silversmith and Talisha Lee. Alexandra Silversmith to go first, followed by Talisha Lee. Time starts now. Let's see if we can, Talisha Lee, can you hear me? If you can hear me, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. There she is, Talisha Lee. Please accept the unmute request uh, and then you can begin your testimony. Talisha Lee or Alexander Silversmith, if you can hear me, please press the raise hand button. And if you intend to testify, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Okay, I see Talisha there. I see Talisha Lee. Talisha Lee, uh, if you can accept the unmute request, uh, then we can take your testimony. If you do not intend okay, to testify, great. you can- I think that worked. Thank you. You got it? Okay. Yeah, okay. Hi, my name is Talisha Lee. Um, I'm reading a letter on behalf of April Simpson. You may begin. Okay. My name is April Simpson, and I'm the president of Queensbridge Houses Resident Association. As the president, my mission is to uplift, encourage, and advocate for residents in public housing. In the last 18 months, we've really seen how badly new housing stock is needed. There are upwards of 50,000 homeless people in New York, including children. Every time we put an affordable unit online, it gives someone a greater opportunity to get a home. I am speaking today to show my support for the 31st Street rezoning as it will provide affordable housing options, a new senior and youth center, along with high quality jobs and community, community programming. One of the reasons I am most passionate about this project is because of the new youth center. High quality youth programs promote positive youth development and offer a safe space where children can explore their potential. This project is partnering with Hannock and Urban Upbound to create programming that best serves Astoria needs. Hannock service to neighborhood, Hannock service to the neighborhood spans almost 50 years since their founding in 1972. They have been providing services including youth programming, adult literacy classes, legal clinics, healthcare access programs, employment and training resources, and family counseling along with running sen several senior centers. Please accept this testimony as my support for the rezoning. Thank you for your time and consideration. Alexandra Silversmith. Alexandra Silversmith, if you can hear me, please accept the unmute request if you see one. There we go, thank you. Time starts now. Good morning, my name is Alexandra Silversmith and I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance for Coney Island. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the third amendment to the leases for Central Amusement International and Dino's Wonder Wheel Amusement Park. My nonprofit, the Alliance for Coney Island, seeks to continue the revitalization of Coney Island and increase visitorship. Both of these entities are critical to the health of the amusement district. The closure in 2020 caused by the COVID-19 pandemic had devastating consequences on their businesses and the surrounding businesses in the district. The pandemic illustrated the degree to which Coney Island truly operates as an ecosystem, and without these two strong operators, the area cannot thrive. Additionally, both businesses have shown a strong commitment to Coney Island with private investment. 
DINOs and CAI both are defying expectations during this pandemic and continuing to invest in the area. DINOs constructed and opened the Phoenix roller coaster, as you've heard, and CAI, as we sit here now, is currently constructing several new attractions that will add to the Coney Island skyline and expand the types of rides and amenities visitors can experience. I'm here today to support the extensions for both entities and also support the subtenants who, are test who have testified today. CAI and DINOs are founding board members of our organization, and the subtenants here today have all been members of the organization since our inception, supporting the community work we do and aiding our work as a nonprofit in the revitalization and economic development of Coney Island. These extensions, particularly in light of the new Omicron variant, are crucial to the stability of the family-owned businesses. The, the character of Coney Island and the longevity of these intergenerational businesses is what makes Coney Island so unique. This year, despite the amusement district fully reopening, business was down on average 25 to 35% 35 from 2019. Many of the businesses who will benefit from this extension only receive relief from PPP. The rules and stipulations for the other programs did not cover them. Though we hope for a brighter future, we know nothing is for certain and extensions are much Time needed. Expired. I thank Councilman Traeger and EDC. Thank you so much for your testimony. We will now try to hear from Michael Serrell. Michael Serrell to speak next. Time starts now. Uh, Michael Serrell, I can see you in the uh, list of speakers. If you can hear me, please uh, accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. I'll take this opportunity to announce that written testimony can be submitted by email to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. If for some reason uh, we're unable to take your testimony today, land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. All right, I think we should proceed to the next panel. Uh, as it happens, that was the last speaker on this panel, Mr. Chair. Uh, so you could excuse this panel and we can see if there's anyone else left. If there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the Coney Island Special Process Agreement Amendment, please press the raise hand button now. Please do not use the raise hand button uh, unless you are wishing to testify on the Coney Island Special Process Agreement Amendment. The meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for any other members. Okay, Mr. Chair, not seeing any hands for new testimony. Uh, uh, once again, this is for anyone who has not already testified. Uh, and with that, Chair Moya, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, uh, thank you. There being no members um, of the public who wish to testify on uh, the preconsidered LU item for the proposed third uh, amendment of the special process agreement related to the Coney Island Amusement Park project plan, the public hearing is now closed and this item is laid over. Uh, I now open the public uh, hearing on the pre-considered uh, LU item for the one uh, Wyeth Avenue Industrial Business uh, Incentive Area proposal, which includes a proposed zoning text amendment under the ULERP number N210273ZRK, and which uh, relates to property in Council Member 11's district in Brooklyn. Once again, if you wish to testify on this item, please visit the Council's website to register. Uh, that link is at the www.council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. And you may also submit written testimony by emailing it to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, and now, Council, if you could please uh, call up the first panel for this item. 
first, uh, the applicant panel for this item will include, uh, once again, Richard Lobel and Fayan Baitan, and also available for a question and answer, we'll have Nick Liberis, Jeremy Zadima, Kevin Williams, and Lewis Handler. I'll ask all panelists now to raise your right hands, please. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee in an answer to all council member questions? Thank you. You may begin, Richard. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Moya. Council members, good morning. Richard LaBelle from Sheldon LaBelle. Uh, I will be presenting the land use um, matters to be, to be considered today, and we'll be joined by uh, Nick Liberis, who will be discussing the architectural aspects of the proposal. Uh, if you can load this slide presentation, please. So we're here today to discuss the One Wythe Avenue IBA Special Permit and Text Amendment. Uh, next slide. This is to establish an industrial business incentive area on three lots uh, in Williamsburg. So the text amendment is to provide for the extension of that IBIA. And then there's a special permit which allows for uh, three aspects. The first is to increase the floor area ratio to permit light industrial and commercial uses. The second to permit an adjustment in the underlying height and setback regulations. And the third to modify accessory off-street parking requirements and loading berth requirements. Uh, again, uh, the IBIA, as has been established through um, the original text amendment and three prior applications, including 103 North 13th most recently, uh, simply allows for as of right floor area in the form of 4.8 of community facility floor area in the subject M12 district to be used instead for uh, incentive uses, industrial uses, business uses to allow for more work to walk to work opportunities and increase uh, uh, job numbers in this area. Next slide. So here you can see there's a tax map with the three sites in question. Uh, the lot area uh, amounts to roughly 16,820 square feet, uh, which given the floor area ratio would allow for a roughly 80,000 square foot building. Nick will run through the relative square footages uh, as he goes through his presentation. Uh, but we do note that there will be 13,000 square feet of industrial uses, which will be located on the ground floor of the proposed building. Next slide. So the area map here indicates uh, what you would expect from this area, which is uh, a heavy um, uh, um, favorite, uh, a heavy um, uh, usage is with regards to manufacturing and commercial uses. So this lot itself and these, this uh, development site was part of the original IBIA prior to the time when it was reduced, uh, and now applicants seeking the special permit are required to come in and ask for this text amendment to expand it over the area. But this was one of the original uh, blocks that was included in the uh, IBIA. Um, you can see, of course, that M11 and M12 use uh, zoning districts abound in the area, uh, particularly here, the three uh, streets around the property give excellent access to the site and make it a particularly appropriate for uh, the uses and bulk that is proposed here. Next slide. So the next slide demonstrates um, existing uses at the site. This is um, as is typical in the M11, given the low FAR and high parking requirements results in primarily one story manufacturing and industrial type buildings. Next slide. Uh, and given that there are also some taller buildings in the area, of course, the William Vale Hotel can be seen several blocks away. Um, and if you wanna just page through the remainder of the pictures uh, and come to the first map after the pictures, you'll see the proposal with regards to the um, special district and the expansion of the IBIA. Uh, of course, there are three sites that are currently included in the IBIA. Um, again, 103 North 13th to the south being the most recently added. Uh, and now, uh, as you can see, the amended and proposed map the IBIA would be mapped over the three lots that are included in this application. Uh, with that, um, I think if you want to forward two slides to the proposed project, uh, these are the square footages. And after that, I'm going to defer over to Nick. Um, so the building, again, would, would be an 80,000 roughly square foot building uh, with 33,000 square feet of permitted uses in the cellar, second and, and fourth floors. 13,000 uh, square feet, roughly, of required industrial uses on the ground floor, 
and 33,600 square feet roughly of incentive uses on floors five through eight. The resulting building would be 110 feet tall and eight stories, similar to other uh, applications approved uh, pursuant to the IBIA with one loading berth and a reduction to no parking spaces. Um, and as we uh, go to the next slide, which has zoning calculations, and I turn this over to Nick, I would merely note that um, this is an application which has received tremendous support, including from Evergreen, which has signed a letter and submitted that into the record and indicates that they are supportive of the application, particularly in light of the high quality industrial space, which will be on the ground floor here. With that, I would defer to Nick. Thank you, Rich. Uh, Nick Liberis with Archimera. Um, as Rich said, we've uh, we've received overwhelming support from the community board and from local light light manufacturing groups. And uh, the basis of this is having this uh, the light manufacturing space on the ground floor. We have about thirteen and a half thousand square feet of very high uh, high quality light uh, manufacturing space on the ground floor. We meet all of the criteria uh, that DCP set forth for this space. Uh, has high high ceilings. It has excellent access to loading. Um, and what what makes this unique is that in this area there's been uh, there's been a lot of talk of keeping uh, the characteristic manufacturing, but it's um, it's often relegated to the second floor um, or higher. And in this case, we've kept it on on the ground floor. Uh, we had uh, uh, in uh, like enlightened ownership and uh, uh, lots of community support uh, that made this possible. Um, next next slide, please. Next, next slide, please. You can see here uh, that the access to this is off of all three streets uh, that the building fronts off of. You have Banker Street to the north, which is uh, the typically more uh, more traffic street by by uh, trucks. Acme is uh, the next block to the uh, to the northwest. North Fifteenth Street is uh, to the south, and we've been hearing a lot recently about the community asking for this to be turned into. Um, um, a pedestrian only promenade that would lead from uh, the inlet into uh, into the park all the way to the east. Um, and then we have White Avenue uh, that the shortest frontage faces. So this is light light manufacturing space, which will be very, uh, very easily accessed from the street. It'll be very, um, um, it'll be very visible to the public. And um, one one other thing that this uh, that this implicates is because of this and and also because of the size of the site and uh, the shape of the site we're, we're unable to come up with a good way to provide parking um, this is something that we've uh, that we've received backing from uh, backing for excuse me from uh, DCP and also the community uh, it's it's quite clear that it, it's it's impossible to have parking really access this site in any way that wouldn't really chop up this this first floor uh, next next slide please So these are uh, these are typical floors coming up. Um, if you could just please please cycle through these quickly. This is uh, the cellar floor. You know these are uh, the typical floors uh, at the base. Then we have the upper office floors. We have very high high quality office space. We have light coming in from, you know all all three three sides, and we have a very good window to um, uh, to office floor depth depth ratio. Uh, there's been a lot of consideration for the quality of this office space and how how it's been it's been set up around the core. Uh, you can see here, as Rich Rich described, you know the maximum height is 110 feet. We have a setback at the eighth floor, which hosts a roof terrace, and there's a significant roof terrace at the fourth floor. Next slide, please. Um, uh, these building axes show uh, the general massing of the building. Uh, there's been terraces provided at uh, multiple floors that are are uh, set up to service various uh, office tenants and uh, fourth fourth floor tenants. Um, the fourth floor has been contemplated to be uh, any any type of uh, of, of uh, as of right uh, uh, use, um, we have thirty three and a half thousand about square feet of of uh, as of right uses, and then we have thirty three and a half thousand square feet of these uh, so called incentive uses, which are uh, uses that are permitted as of right, uh, but have then been kind of called down. So it's mainly office space uh, that's uh, that's permitted in that incentive use uh, upper bit. Uh, next next slide, please. Um, this this was the presentation that we gave to the community board, which showed that there is uh, there's sufficient parking in this area uh, to support the request for us to uh, to reduce parking to zero. So you can see that there are in excess of of, of uh, 15 properties within a few few block radius that have excess capacity 
Um, this is something that we've uh, that we've been keeping very close close track of. Um, uh, first, starting with that other special permit project that uh, that we had approved um, a few years back, 103 North North 13th, and then with other ones coming up, you know, we are we are very keen, you know, to support a um, as uh, as uh, like reduced traffic a scheme as we as we can with with the support of city planning and the community, but we always have to be mindful, you know, of making sure that we meet uh, the criteria of the zoning as it's currently written for for parking uh, to the best of our um, ability. So this shows that you know even though we don't quite quite do it, there is enough there uh, to provide what what the site actually you know requires based based on the uses on site. Next slide, please. And you can see here, this is this is uh, I think uh, one of the most um, uh, the most appealing views of the building. This is coming from the east, looking west. On the west side, you have uh, 15th Street, which is leading towards uh, the future Bushwick Inlet Park. On the right side, you have you have Banker, and we've taken great pain to make sure that there is a graceful massing as this thing steps back from this very um, acute corner and what's what's been created is some is some very nice uh, public space also at the end and we um, anticipate with the open open streets program and also you know future support from the city that as as this neighborhood changes that this will only serve uh, to further enhance um, uh, the pedestrian aspect of this area uh, which is so so uh, so characteristic of it and with that uh, my presentation concludes uh, thank you everybody Thank you, and, and as an applicant team, we also wanted to take the opportunity, uh, given that this may be the last special permit considered during the current council term, to uh, thank Council Member Levin for his involvement, um, both in the creation and the, uh, the uh, opportunities to sustain this special permit, which uh, has been a boon to the area, and which as an applicant, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with the community board uh, on these applications and really uh, bring job growth and walk to work opportunities to this area. So with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, just one quick um, question here before I turn it over to Council Member Levin. Um, within the uh, an industrial business uh, incentive area, a special permit to allow an increase in the FAR from 2.0 to 4.8 requires that the building provide a minimum of 0 0.8 FAR required industrial uses. Uh, what plans are proposed for this re required use and how many manufacturing jobs can we expect to be created uh, by this development? Nick, can you talk a little bit about the proposed users given your familiarity with the area and those sure. parts? Yeah, sure. So we have about 14,000 square feet uh, that, uh, that's been provided. The way that it's been set up on this ground floor, um, it's anticipated that it could be demised into, into several smaller spaces. And it's also... Uh, set up because of the office floor plate up above, with a very wide wide spacing to the columns in a way which which would also support uh, just a single user that would want a big wide open space. So, in this area, typically there's uh, there's uses ranging from uh, from alcohol manufacturing. Uh, there's several brewers in this area, uh, all the way down to people that um, you know that uh, that make custom watches, uh, custom jewelry. There's fabric making, print making, you know, uh, furniture making. There's all sorts of uh, Smaller types of uses uh, um, that uh, that inhabit spaces all over the neighborhood up into Greenpoint. So, uh, the Greenpoint Manufacturing Center, 67 West Street, 42 West Street. Um, there's a couple of other addresses that are now um, eluding me, but there's five or six uh, very significant, um, you know, warehouse type type spaces that now house house these uses. And uh, this is anecdotal. We we we've always had had um, uh, we've had offices in these in these spaces. And during during COVID, um, we we left for about a year and a half. And when we came came back, I mean, everything had been had been rented out almost immediately, uh, going back to um, you know to late 2020. So there's uh, there's a tremendous demand, and there's really there's a shortfall of these of these spaces. And um, you know, I we we can't know who is going to be uh, the person or the person signing into the spaces, but um, we could uh, uh, we could definitely vouch uh, for the quantity of of, of a demand for such spaces and um, um, you know as to who it could be I really can't can't comment but I'm sure that if you go and visit in the next year um, it'll be fully occupied 
or I guess after it's been built, sorry, not the next year, because it's going to take a little bit of time to build it. Okay, thank you, uh, sure. Nick. Uh, that's it for me with questions. Uh, I now want to uh, turn it over to Council Member Levin uh, for questions. Time starts now. Do we have Council Member Levin still on? Uh, I see Council Member Levin is logged in. I just can't confirm that he's, I can't see his uh, video. Let me. I, I just reached out to Council Member Levin. Um, I'm going to give him about uh, a minute to see if he responds. Uh, if not, we're going to have to move on um, to the next uh, panel. Okay. Um, I have not gotten a confirmation back from Council Member Levin. Um, so, do we have any Council Members that have any questions for this panel? Uh, no, Chair. I see no other members uh, with questions for the panel. Okay. Uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel uh, is excused. Sorry about that, uh, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Uh, there we go, Steve. Okay, sorry about that. I I was I had to step out for a second. Um, no, I just uh, I want to thank uh, this application um, for uh, engaging with us. I, I wanted to ask about um, uh, uh, your willingness to commit to um, option one as part of MIH. Oh, um, council member, this is the um, this, is this is the, the other app MIH application. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, okay. That's that. Uh, this is. I'm, I'm okay. I think I think with questions on this item, uh, I do have questions on the other item. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Council Member Levin. Uh, seeing that there are no other members um, who have any questions for this panel, this panel is now excused. And Council, do we have any uh, members of the public who wish to testify on this item? Any members of the public wishing to testify on the One Wyeth Avenue IBI? IB? A proposal should please are asked to please press the raise hand button now, Mr. Chair. The meeting will briefly stand at ease while we just confirm. Okay, Chair Moy, I see no other members of the no members of the public who wish to testify uh, on this item. Okay, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU items for the one uh, wife Avenue uh, IBIA proposal under ULIP number N2102730 ZRK. The public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. We're going to go to the next item. Uh, I now open the public hearing on two pre-considered LU items under C210166 ZMK and N210167 uh, N210167 uh, ZRK for the 79 Key Street rezoning, uh, requesting a zoning map and zoning text amendment relating to property in Council Member 11's district in Brooklyn. Uh, once again, anyone wishing to testify on this item, if you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the Council's website. Uh, once again, at council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Uh, council, if you could, please call up the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Richard Lobel, uh, Fayon Baitan. Available for a question and answer it will be Kevin Williams, Steve Wagoda, and Harry Einhorn. Uh, for those of you who don't already remain under oath, please raise your right hands. 
Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony uh, you give to the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all council member questions truthfully? Thank you. You may begin, Richard, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair Moya. Council members, good morning. Richard LaBelle of Shield Mobile PC. Uh, for the application at 79 Key Street, uh, this is for a proposed rezoning. If you can load the slide presentation, please. I'm also hoping at the end of the presentation that Council Member Levin can finally answer whether it is key, K, or quay, because Merriam-Webster Dictionary allows for all three pronunciations. So good morning again. Uh, we're here for the 79 Key Street rezoning. Next slide. The rezoning would rezone uh, a current M12 R6A M8 special mixed use district uh, as was rezoned in the um, Greenpoint Williamsburg rezoning to an, an R M14 R70 district. Um, what this would allow for would be the development of a nine story, approximately 92,000 square foot building, uh, roughly 5.58 FAR with 86 dwelling units. And then depending on the level of affordability, 22 under option one or 26 under option two affordable units. Uh, the, the zoning map amendment application consists of um, two aspects. The first would be the zoning map amendment change, the zoning change to the M14R7D, and the second being a text amendment uh, to not only amend the special district text under MX8, but also to, uh, of course, provide for um, uh, mandatory inclusionary housing on the site. Next slide. So uh, as you can see here, this is a zoning map. Uh, again, the uh, 2005 um, Greenpoint Williamsburg rezoning created many of the um, mixed use districts in this area, including at the subject site. Uh, next slide. So you can see here that the M12 R6A uh, currently covers the property with R6B to the east and R6 and R8 districts to the west. Uh, next slide. The next slide is the tax map, which shows with greater specificity what is proposed at the site. This is an M14R7D. Uh, why is this appropriate at the site? Um, particularly here because you've got existing R6B and R6A districts, particularly R6B districts to the east, and you have um, you have uh, R8 and R6 districts to the west, which is more easily seen on the next slide which have largely resulted uh, on the West in building heights ranging from 14 to 33 stories. So particularly here, the opportunity to put an R7D mixed use district to allow for a nine story building allows for appropriate transition from the taller buildings to the West to the smaller and shorter buildings to the East. In addition, Key Street here operates as a corridor towards the waterfront uh, and the opportunity to Put new development here and to enliven this corner with some retail uh, is something which is seen as valuable to the surrounding area. Um, the site itself, as you can see uh, in red, is roughly 16,500 square feet. Two other lots would be partially included uh, in this proposed rezoning. Next slide. So the next slide demonstrates the actual zoning change map. You can see on the left uh, the existing M12 R6A. And on the right, the change in the dotted portion for the M14 R7D. Uh, we note that R6A, depending on the um, affordability and uh, inclusionary housing, can result in floor area ratios of 3 to 3.6. So the transition here to uh, an R7D uh, is seen as particularly appropriate, uh, as has been confirmed in the approvals of the community board, the um, Brooklyn Borough President, and uh, City Planning Commission. We further note that the community board here did issue a unanimous recommendation. We were uh, happy and proud to receive that. Next slide. So here you see photos of the site and the surrounding area. Again, um, the site has remained largely unde underdeveloped uh, with one to three story buildings, despite the rezoning in 2005 uh, to the R6A district. Um, you know, generally commercial uh, uses at the property. Next slide. And resulting in, in warehouse type development. Uh, I think if you wanna fast forward through this pictures, we can get to the first slide demonstrating the building plans. Um, I would briefly run through those building plans. Um, so you have in front of you 
a nine story building, uh, which sets back after the seventh story. Next slide. This slide includes zoning calculations. Primarily of note here is that the bedroom mix results in uh, 13 studios, 31 one bedrooms, 29 two bedrooms, and 13 three bedrooms. One of the uh, things that the R7D permits here is to allow for a, uh, a wider floor plate and more floor area to flesh out these units uh, so that we're able to bring larger units to the community. This is something that was seen as a huge benefit um, to allow for a large number of three bedrooms as well as two bedrooms. Uh, and importantly, pursuant to mandatory inclusionary housing, uh, the units in the building generally uh, will mirror the inclusionary units such that the inclusionary units will include uh, the same mix of one, twos, and threes. So uh, this is actually the opportunity to allow for affordability and affordability uh, at larger bedroom sizes, which is um, you know, one of the goals of, of the program. Uh, next slide. The next slide merely shows an elevation dem demonstrating the various um, uh, building levels at the site, uh, ranging from six to nine stories. Next slide. Uh, the, this slide demonstrates the parking at the site, resulting in 31 uh, below, uh, below grade parking spaces. Next slide. There's the uh, retail on the ground floor, um, 10,000 square feet of new retail space and a residential lobby. And then if you uh, would page through the remainder of the slides, this simply shows the um, unit layouts per floor, uh, the sec six, second through sixth floor, and then the setback seven and eight stories. Uh, we also include copies uh, in the next two slides of the building elevations, um, both from the south as well as the west. And finally, uh, building section, uh, which shows the um, commercial on the ground floor, uh, followed by the residential uses on floors two through nine above. Um, there you go. So with that, if you just wanna page through the last three slides, um, this is just a massing of the building, uh, particularly, uh, you know, uh, it's prevalent that there is larger building types to the west of the site. Uh, and uh, the result there, thank you for doing that. <laughs> Didn't need to go too fast. And um, you can see the, the larger buildings uh, to the west of West Street. And then, um, you know, as you page through to the end, a rendering which demonstrates uh, the proposal and the massing uh, as it currently exists. Uh, with that, the applicant team is happy to answer any questions. Um, sorry, can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you uh, for the, your testimony. I'm gonna turn it over for questions now uh, to council member Levin. Okay, uh, thank you very much, chair. Just add a question, I'm sorry about the, the mix up. By the way, I, um, I say Quay Street. Okay. I think, I think that's what most green pointers say, but um, I'm pretty sure I, it's it's a small street, so you know it doesn't get a lot of it doesn't get a lot of foot traffic. Um, I, I think every time we say it, we say it wrong, so we're happy to have you. <laughs> um, uh, so on on the MIH option, um, the applicant willing to uh, commit to option one? Yeah, we've discussed that with uh, Mr. Einhorn, um, and uh, obviously it's the prerogative of the council member here. Uh, we understand that there's um, a unity of interest in the opportunity to bring. Uh, the community some real affordability so uh, we are happy to um to acquiesce and and um, understand that this will be mod so modified okay um and then in terms of um like sustainability measures at this development site um can you speak to that a little bit sure um i'd actually ask if steve steve wygoda who's the project architect is standing by uh is steve are you able to talk about sustainability at the site yeah i can can you hear me yes Okay, I'm not on video, I apologize. But we, um, we're, we're looking to uh, do, uh, we're looking at the solar energy, the green roof, the exterior wall functions. We put some green planting along the street um, and, and we're trying to use some materials that are environmentally uh, sustainable, um, you know, but so we're gonna we're gonna come in once we begin the design of the building. We commit to doing all of those sustainability factors uh, in our design. So the answer is yes. We 
We also like the sustainability of the terraces that have the wonderful view towards the, uh, the river. And that has sort of a, in my interpretation of sustainability, that means that those families will stay there for a while. It'll be a really cool place to live. So we sustain the families and we provide, I think 26 is what, but it depends which option we go with. So uh, just to keep it short, th that's our approach to the sustainability aspect. Okay, and the applicant would be willing to um, to make some commitments that we can um, talk about after this hearing to um, to uh, memorialize the commitments on sustainability measures. Sure, uh, Council Member, we're happy to discuss that um, you know as we go forward and and to uh, and uh, to do so to your satisfaction. Okay, um, and. Uh, uh, Rich, I, 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 I should have asked that question uh, as well to the previous applicants, um, but uh, understanding that that hearing is closed, uh, we can have that conversation um, post-hearing. Okay. okay. Thank you. Rich, Thank you very Rich, much, Chair. Sorry, Rich, just for the record, Richard, it's Steve. Oh, okay. Um, I'm, yeah. Sorry. I just want to add, the parking is above grade, and I'm just because you're recording it because we, we're in a very high water table, and Rich, I think you might have said below grade. Sure, apologies. No problem. Okay. And obviously I'm, I'm in favor of as minimal parking as possible. Um, and um, if you were able to do no parking, I would be in favor of that. Um, that's something that we could talk about after as well. Um, um, okay, it seems that I am currently the acting chair. Uh, so, uh, does anyone else have any questions on this item? Okay. Seeing none, I think. Yes, I, I, oh, go ahead. Correct. No, I, I, no, I don't see any members with questions. Oh, okay. Th thank you, Arthur. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so um, uh, on that note, um, we will let the, um, the applicant go. Uh, thank you very much for um, your presentation uh, and look forward to... Uh, working with you over the next week or so to um, uh, to see if we can get both of these projects to an approval stage. Um, and uh, um, I think that they bring both projects uh, real benefit to um, to the neighborhood uh, and have you know a minimal um, you know any any uh, you know negative effects are are are, are mitigated and minimal in, the, in, in my opinion at this point. So just want to work through uh, some of the details as we move forward. Thank you, council member. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, so seeing uh, no other um, uh, members that are wish to ask questions, I will um, ask if there are any members of the public to testify on this item. Uh, Chair Levin, I'm gonna take this moment to just make a quick uh, technical announcement for anyone who may be uh, logged in and wishing to testify as a public speaker. Uh, we ask that you register online at the council's website uh, for, before you do so. Uh, and with that, uh, we have no advanced registrations, uh, but we'll ask now that if anyone would like to testify on, uh, as a public uh, witness on this item to please use the raise hand button now. Okay, uh, Chair, it appears that we uh, have no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Oh, sorry. Uh, just, just to make sure uh, for anyone uh, wishing to testify and has not already registered and is here by phone, you can use the raise hand button by pressing star nine. Star nine on your keypad of a telephone if you intend to testify on this item. All right, Chair, thank you. Uh, I see no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Council. Um, I will recommend that you close the uh, hearing oh, yes, on page okay. 15. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm looking for the, for the notes here. Um, yeah. um, 
I don't have it in page format. So if you'll bear with me here. Okay. Sorry, Arthur, I'm, I'm, uh, okay. I'm in. I'm sending you a quick statement on this now. Okay. Uh, just with the, Got just it. with the. Uh, oh, I see. Members. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, okay. Page 15. Middle of page 15. Closing. By announcing the ULIP numbers. Um, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on pre-considered LU items for 79 Quay Street rezoning proposal under ULIP numbers C210166 ZMK and N210167 ZRK, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. And now we will uh, be on page 21 okay. to continue. Okay. Uh, I'm now opening the public hearing on LU numbers 932 through 936 related to a number of land use actions related to the river ring proposal in my district in Brooklyn, uh, council Member 11 district in Brooklyn, uh, which and which also include a zoning text amendment and zoning map amendment. I'll note that in, in conjunction with those related pre-considered zoning map and text amendments, the subcommittee held a public hearing on November 18th um, and took comprehensive testimony concerning the anticipated development under the proposal in its entirety. That is pursuant to all eight related actions. At this time, I'll ask council whether we have any members of the public signed up to testify today on this item. Yes, Chair, I believe that we do have, we did have one advanced registration for this item. If we have Renzo Ramirez, Renzo Ramirez will be the, uh, at this moment, the lone speaker on this item, Renzo Ramirez to testify on the River Ring items. All right, Chair, um, I have been informed that uh, Renzo Ramirez did cancel his registration. So with that, uh, if there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the River Ring items, we ask that you use the raise hand button now. All right, Mr. Chair, with that, there are, uh, I see no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Um, there being no questions for this panel or <laughs> for this, for this panel, the witness panel is not, <laughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, I could direct you to page 24. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, there being number, <laughs> there being no members of the public who wish to testify on land use numbers 932 through 936 for the river room proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. And now we're on to the very next item, the Archer okay. Avenue. Great. I now open the public hearing on land use number 938 for 160-05 Archer Avenue proposal, which seeks a zoning text amendment related to property in council member Miller's district in Queens. I remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify in this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online. And you may do that now by visiting the council's website at council.nyc.gov slash land use, one word, land use. Okay, um, council, can you please call the first panel for this item? The applicant panel for this item will include Rachel Skull, land use counsel for the applicant and Hugo Corbo.
Balan uh, for the applicant. I'll Sorry, ask the panelists now to. I think we have Harley Brown instead of Hugo Cortla on our projects. Okay, Harley Brown, I'll ask both panelists to please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Starting time. Um, if I could please have our slides, thank you. Good just afternoon. My name is Rachel Skull and I'm an associate at Greenberg Charig. We represent Archer One LLC in this application to allow a curb cut on a currently restricted portion of Archer Avenue. Uh, the application has received the support of the borough president as well as unanimous approval of the community board. I am joined today by Harley Brown on behalf of ownership. Um, if I could just get the slides. Are we having technical difficulties with the slides? Oh, thank you. Um, next slide, please. Sorry. Thank you. Archer One LLC owns 160-05 Archer Avenue, located at the northeast corner of Archer Avenue and 160th Street, just north of the above ground LIRR tracks in the special downtown Jamaica district. Next slide, please. The site is currently being developed with an as of right 22 story building that will contain 315 dwelling units, as well as ground floor and cellar retail or medical use. Construction is about 75% complete, and we expect people to begin moving into the building in March 2022. Next slide, please. We would like to provide a permitted, not required loading berth for residents moving in and out of the building, as well as the retail or medical tenant as needed. The new building does not have space for a loading berth curb cut on 160th Street because the curb cut cannot be located within 50 feet of the intersection, and the balance of the 160th Street frontage is occupied by the new building's residential parking and residential lobby. Therefore, we are seeking a text amendment to create an authorization that would allow the City Planning Commission to authorize curb cuts on restricted streets where a zoning lot has more than one street frontage in the special downtown Jamaica district. We are simultaneously applying for this authorization and are proposing this 14 foot wide curb cut on Archer Avenue. Next slide, please. The proposed authorization requires that we meet the findings shown here related to traffic safety and flow and pedestrian safety. With regards to findings one, two, and four, the proposed curb cut would not be hazardous to traffic safety. It is expected to draw minimal traffic and its use would be pre-scheduled with a flagman present during daytime use. As a result of conversations with the community board and council member Miller, we have agreed that the loading berth would not be used during AM rush hour or PM rush hour, and that any use of the loading berth by a retail tenant would take place overnight. The proposed curb cut would prevent curbside pickups and drop-offs by moving vans or trucks and by giving them an off-street place to pull off. With regard to, to finding three, the loading berth associated with the curb cut would prevent trucks from coming to the site and blocking the sidewalk or idling curbside or double parking, and the proposed flagman would ensure pedestrian safety. With regard to finding five, the proposed curb cut will not be inconsistent with the character of the existing streetscape. The portion of the site's Archer Avenue frontage that was occupied by curb cuts prior to the beginning of construction would be reduced from what was currently, what was previously there. And neighboring blocks also feature curb cuts on Archer Avenue. And with that, um, Harley and I are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, bringing up. Um, I don't have any questions on this item. I'm sorry, I'm just bringing up the... Um, are there, do any of the other members of the subcommittee have any questions on this item? Uh, if you sure. have questions, sorry, if you have questions, please use the raise hand function. 
see no members with uh, hands raised for questions. Okay. Uh, there being no questions, the the applicant panel is excused. Um, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on 160-05 Archer Avenue proposal? Chair, sure, we have no advanced registrations, but we'll ask now uh, if anyone uh, from the public does intend to testify on the Archer Avenue proposal to please use the raise hand button now. It appears, Chair Levin, that uh, we have no members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay. Um, there being um, no members of the public who wish to testify on 160-05 Archer Avenue proposal, please, um, um, sorry, um, uh, which is LU-938, um, uh, 160-05 Archer Avenue. Um, the public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. Uh, we'll next turn to um, Beach uh, 79th Street self-storage. <coughs> um, I'm now opening the public hearing on LU 937 for the Beach 79th Street self-storage proposal, which seeks a zoning map amendment related to property in Council Member Brooks Powers' district in Queens. For anyone wishing to testify on this item, if you have not already done so, you must register online, and you may do that now by visiting the Council's website at council.nyc.gov slash land use, one word, land use. Um, Council, would you please call the first panel for this item? The applicant panel for this item will include, uh, again, Rachel Skull, Land Use Council for the applicant, and Uri Kaufman uh, for the applicant. Panelists, please, uh, or I guess Ms. Skull, you remain under oath, uh, please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? Yes. Um, if I could please get the slides for this one, thank you. <coughs> Hello again. My Already name is done. Rachel Skull, and I'm an associate at Greenberg Charter. We represent the applicant 79 Arvin Development LLC, owner of an approximately 107,500 square foot development site at block 16100, lots 14, 18, and 20 on the north side of Rockaway Freeway at the terminus of Beach 79th Street. I am joined today by Uri Kaufman on behalf of ownership. Our client purchased this property in January 20, 2018 and planned to convert an existing 34,500 square foot building on the site to self-storage and to construct a new approximately 73,000 square foot building on a vacant portion of the site. Instead, we are pursuing the proposed rezoning, which would increase the FAR available on the site from one to two. Next slide, please. This would allow the existing building, housing seven industrial tenants with approximately 55 employees to remain. You see the industrial building here. Uh, next slide, please. And a new approximately 146,000 square foot self-storage building to be constructed on a vacant portion of the site seen here. Next slide, please. The proposed development site is located on the north side of Rockaway Freeway and, and the above ground subway tracks at the terminus of Beach 79th Street. Next slide, please. It fronts on Rockaway Freeway and backs onto Barbados Basin and is adjacent to Brandreth, Brandreth Creek to the west. Next slide, please. The site surrounding area is largely industrial and residential uses to the south are cut off from the site by the above ground subway tracks and vacant parcels. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning would rezone a portion of an existing M11 district to an M12 district. Next slide, please, thank you. It would overlap with portions of city owned property that make up the adjacent street and sidewalk and Brandreth Creek. Approximately 16% of the rezoning area is made up of city owned land, 2% by another private party and 82% is applicant owned. Next slide, please. The new building except entrances would be raised above flood hazard levels and its entrances would be dry flood proofed. Parking would be on the ground level beneath the occupiable portions of the building. The building would, would be approximately 90 feet tall from grade 
It would have six floors of self-storage units containing approximately 950 climate-controlled storage units of various sizes. Next slide, please. We will also be repaving the property's drive lane with permeable pavers, planting a wetlands mitigation area adjacent to Barbados Basin pursuant to a DEC <laughs> wetlands permit, adding landscaping at the front of the site, and adding picnic tables adjacent to the wetlands area that would be open to the public as well as the existing industrial tenants. Pursuant to DEC's Voluntary Brownfields Program, we have a plan in place to clean up hazardous materials at the development site that have resulted from its previous almost or more than 100 years of industrial use. Without the proposed rezoning, oh, next slide, please. Without the proposed rezoning, we could have a total of 107,500 square feet of self-storage on the site. The proposed rezoning represents an increase of approximately 38,500 square feet of self-storage on the site and would allow us to keep the existing industrial uses. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning area makes up a discrete area separated from low density residential areas and more pedestrian focused streets, allowing the area to support higher density industrial development without disturbing nearby abuses. Uses immediately surrounding the proposed rezoning area are industrial in nature and have been since before adoption of the 1961 zoning resolution. We are excited to be a part of the Rockways community and hope to be a positive addition. To that end, my client has set forth commitments in a letter to Council Member Brooks Powers, including to conduct a traffic study at the site once the proposed storage facility is open and to fund the installation of a traffic light if needed. The letter also outlines goals for local hiring, both for construction jobs and permanent jobs. Now I will turn it over to Uri Kaufman to provide a little bit more information about the demand for self-storage in the area. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, my name is Uri Kaufman. Um, I grew up in Queens. Uh, I now live about 15 minutes away from the site. I've been a real estate developer for almost 30 years. I've built uh, self-storage facilities in other parts of our state and elsewhere. We bought the site in January, 2018 with the idea of turning it into a self-storage facility because the Rockaways are not so much lacking in storage. It's basically non-existent. It's astonishing um, how there's almost none out there at all. We did a study that showed there's about 700,000 feet of unmet demand. We expect this facility to serve people in the uh, local community, particularly people with smaller homes, people in affordable housing apartments. It's anyone in sort of some sort of transition in their lives, people moving, people who are divorced, uh, soldiers who are mustering abroad. And then it's most importantly for small businessmen, every electrician, every plumber, every gardener, every sheetrock hanger, every artisan, artist, anyone uh, with an Amazon business, an Etsy business, anyone who needs micro warehousing, there are many, many such people. There's literally nothing for these people right now. They have to travel quite a distance to get those vital services. Uh, the storage facility itself will not create a lot of direct jobs. Uh, actually, our industrial complex there is a pretty important local job creator. Uh, however, to the extent that the storage facility will create jobs, and it will, uh, we will reach out to the local community, particularly people who can walk to work, which there'd be quite a few of those. In fact, interestingly enough, while I was waiting for my turn to testify, I got a call from a local person asking for a job there, and I told them to please send me his resume, um, and we will certainly give him every consideration. His name is he's a Mr. Hunt. Uh, we're very excited to be part of this project. As I said, I only live about 15 minutes away. I grew up in Queens myself, so it's great to do a really good project like this in my own backyard. And thank you very much. Thank you. We're happy to answer any questions. Um, okay, thank you. And you, you, um, you said that, I just want to confirm that you were willing to do a traffic monitoring program and make additional improvements to the intersection um, uh, that are needed by, um, by DOT once the project is built. Sure. So we are planning to, within six months of the storage facility opening, we would go back out and restudy the traffic conditions to see whether our study shows a need to uh, reopen that intersection there and install a traffic light, or if DOT were to independently come to the conclusion that that intersection should be re reopened and we needed to install a traffic light, we would still fund the, the purchase of the traffic light and the installation. Okay. So I'm, I'm just looking at the, it's a, you know, very little infrastructure I'm just looking on Google Maps right now and then that intersection, very little um, infrastructure there. Um, are there other improvements that um, 
that have been discussed other than uh, like a traffic light, any other type of um, you know, like stormwater mitigation, um, if there's any flooding mitigation or anything like that? Sure. So as part of our TEC application, we're, we're required to uh, plant a 50 foot wide wetlands area. That area is designed to provide that type of stormwater mitigation. It will be fully replanted with native plantings. The idea is that it will allow for tides to come in. It will allow for absorption of groundwater. We're also replacing any paving in the drive lane right now with permeable pavers, which should also help with stormwater. Um, okay. Uh, no, I appreciate it very much. Um, uh, I think that's all the questions that I have. Do any other members of the subcommittee have questions for this applicant? Chair, I see okay. no members with questions. Okay. Um, okay, uh, there being no questions, uh, the panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on Beach 79th Street self-storage proposal? Uh, no, Chair, we have no advanced registrations, but we'll ask uh, at this time whether um, any members of the public uh, who do wish to testify on this item are asked to please use the raise hand button now. All right, uh, Chair Levin, I see no members of the public wishing to testify on this item. Okay, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on LU 937 for the Beach 79th Street self storage proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. Um, councils, the, is this next item uh, 45 20 83rd Street? That's already been heard this morning. That's right. That's right. Okay. Okay. We will be skipping ahead then to. 31st Street and Hoyt Avenue. Uh, I now open the public hearing on two pre-considered pre LU items for the 31st Street and Hoyt Avenue rezoning proposal, which seeks a zoning map and zoning text amendment under ULERPS numbers C210200 ZMQ and N210201 ZRQ and related property in council member Tiffany Cabon's district in Queens. I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item, if you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website at council.nyc.gov slash land use. Um, and I wanna turn it over to Council Member Caban for opening statement. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Acting Chair Levin and the members of the committee. Um, this is literally my first full day on the job. And so I also want to extend thanks to the land use division who gave me a, a really incredible briefing um, yesterday. And I want to be upfront and name that I'm coming in at the end of this, this process. Like I, I feel like I'm not coming in at the ninth inning. I'm coming in at the last out of the ninth inning. Um, I know that this is a project that's been going on for years that my predecessor account former council member Constantinides was very engaged on. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm working as, as quickly as I can to get up to speed and continue to learn. And I, I do just want to very briefly name a, a, a few things that I care about, things like deeper affordability, um, assessing displacement risk, working in partnership with both community and labor so that the folks that are most Im directly impacted are ideating and um, you know art articulating the things that we want and need. Uh, so we're developing to the needs of our community and, and the city as a, a whole. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from folks in the community on this project. Thanks y'all. Thank you, man. Thank you, Council Member Caban. Um, and uh, Council, would you please call the first panel for this item? The applicant panel for this item will include uh, Frank St. Jacques, uh, Land Use Counsel for the applicant. St. Jacques, please raise your right hand. Be swear or affirm uh, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in an answer to all council member questions. I do. Thank you. Starting uh, time. Thank you. Um, could you please load the presentation? Uh, and uh, good morning, uh, Acting Chair Levin, uh, Council Member Caban, and committee members. Um, I have a, a 
brief presentation, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. And I'll also just say at the outset, uh, Council Member Kaban, we, we recognize that, that you're you're just coming into this project, uh, but we welcome your input and we look forward to, to working with you uh, as we move towards the conclusion of ULERP. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> This slide pr provides an overview of, of the, uh, the rezoning. Um, the proposed zoning map and text amendments will promote transit-oriented mixed-use development in Astoria at three underutilized sites on, 31st, on the 31st Street corridor on wide streets with excellent access to mass transit and open space. The project vision is to revitalize the section of 31st Street near the recently renovated Astoria Boulevard station with significant community benefits, including new housing, with permanently income restricted units under MIH option one or mandatory inclusionary housing option one, a partnership with local nonprofit Hannock to provide senior and youth programming in two of the buildings and a daycare and local retail uh, along with about 193 associated jobs. Next slide, please. The three development sites and surrounding context are shown in this aerial view. The rezoning area, again, is highly transit oriented with access to the Astoria Boulevard station and several bus lines. And the Ditmars Boulevard station is also a few blocks to the north. The elevated railway above 31st Street dominates the streetscape and there's currently very little active ground floor use uh, on this portion of 31st Street, despite being right next to the uh, train station and Hoyt playground, uh, where you would expect to find this type of local retail. Uh, this results in an uninviting and dark pedestrian experience and is in contrast to other portions of 31st Street and other similar corridors through Astoria. Development Site 1 is the southernmost site. Uh, it's currently a one-story restaurant building with a service parking lot. Development Site 2 is currently a large retail store with a blank street wall and surface parking lot. And the northernmost site, Development Site 3, was formerly industrial buildings. Next slide, please. In the next few slides, I'll go over the project details. Uh, again, starting with the southernmost site, uh, in these photographs of development site one, you can see the uh, elevated rail above 31st Street uh, and the entrance to the Astoria Boulevard station. Development site one is located at the northeastern corner of the intersection of 31st Street and Astoria Boulevard North. Uh, it's an approximately 10,000 square foot flag-shaped corner lot. Next slide, please. The proposed development on development site one is an 11 story mixed use building with 51 dwelling units, including 13 income restricted units under MIH option one. It also contains about 10,784 square feet of commercial floor area on the first and second floors and 3,064 square feet of community facility floor area intended for a daycare on the second floor. About 63% of the units are two and three bedroom uh, family size units and local retail would activate the streetscape, uh, as you can see on the uh, rendering on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to the north across 24th Road is Development Site 2. In these photographs, you can see the long blank street wall uh, for the, the Staples retail store and fence surface parking. Development Site 2 is the largest of the three sites at about 29,638 square feet. Next slide, please. Uh, the proposed development on development site two is a 12 story mixed use building with 161 units, including 40 income restricted units. It also contains uh, 14,454 square feet of commercial floor area and 3,962 square feet of community facility floor area intended for Hannock to provide senior programming on the first floor. Just over half of the units are two and three uh, bedroom family units. Again, here local retail uses will activate the streetscape and improve the pedestrian experience along this portion of 31st Street. Next slide, please. Finally, the northernmost site is Development Site 3, just north of 24th Avenue. Uh, it's a 13,503 square foot uh, uh, rectangular lot. Next slide, please. And so finally, the proposed development on Development Site 3 is an 11-story mixed-use building with 63 units, 16 of which would be permanently income-restricted under MIH Option 1. 
It also contains 7,043 square feet of commercial uh, floor area for ground floor local retail uh, and community facility use on the second and third floors, including about 8,000 square feet of space for Hannock to provide youth programming. And here about 54% uh, of the units are two and three bedrooms. Next slide, please. So the bulk regulations of the currently mapped C43 zoning district are an important factor in the rationale for the rezoning. The 2010 Astoria rezoning changed the uh, R5, Z R5 district that had been mapped in 1961 to the current C43 zoning district. Uh, unlike other areas within the Astoria rezoning, the voluntary inclusionary housing program was not made available in this area. Uh, we believe this rezoning is an opportunity to refine the, the zoning uh, to allow more housing at nearly the same bulk envelope that is allowed today under the C43 zoning. Uh, this slide provides a comparison between the maximum floor area ratio, or FAR, and the height that is permitted in the current and proposed zoning districts. So on the left-hand side, you see the existing C43 and the proposed C45X and C44 under MIH um, with a, a comparison. Um, and as you can see, the rezoning resent, represents an increase of 1.2 FAR from the C43 uh, to the C45X and an increase of 1.7 FAR from the C43 uh, to the C44. The proposed zoning districts would allow more housing production versus community facility use and would also require the provision of permanently income restricted units under MIH option one with a similar bulk envelope to the current C43. The rezoning would promote a revitalization of this transit oriented area. Next slide, please. This slide shows a comparison of as of right development versus development under the proposed zoning. Uh, while the building heights are about the same, the rezoning promotes more housing development and requires, uh, again, that permanently income restricted units be provided under MIH option one. Next slide, please. So under MIH, uh, uh, excuse me, mandatory inclusionary housing or MIH option one, uh, the um, requirements for option one are a weighted average of 60% AMI. Um, and the breakdown is shown here um, for all three projects combined. Um, of the 69 permanently income restricted units under MIH option one, 24 units would be provided at 40% AMI, 25 units at 60% AMI, and 20 units at 80% AMI. And you can see the corresponding rents and income limits in each income band. Uh, and I'll just note that according to American Community Survey data, um, the local census tracts 115 and 125 um, that the project is within have a median household income of $81,596. The um, slightly larger area, the Steinway Q72 Neighborhood Tabulation Area, or NTA, has a median household income of $74,388. And the much wider um, approximate of Community District 1 has a median household income of $63,592. Uh, so we believe that these, um, uh, uh, the affordability under MIH Option 1 uh, is appropriate for the site. I'm um, going to we'll also note that um, this permanently income restricted housing would be provided without any city subsidy. Next slide, please. Uh, the proposed project, um, we have a conservative estimate that it would create about 193 jobs. Um, we've uh, signed an agreement with uh, 32BJ for prevailing uh, uh, wage building service worker jobs. Um, we've submitted a letter to the council regarding the applicant's commitment to local and MWBE hiring. And we're also partnering with local nonprofit Urban Upbound uh, on job placement and workforce development. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, we are partnering with uh, uh, Hannock uh, to be both the project's MIH administering agent and to operate uh, community facility space uh, at development sites two and three um, with the intention of providing uh, uh, senior uh, programming at development site two and in the larger space at development site three youth programming. Next slide, please. So that concludes uh, my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
thank you very much to the applicant. Uh, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Kaban uh, for questions. Starting uh, time. Thank you. Um, I just have a, a few questions. I understand that there are no significant um, adverse impacts related to shadows, but there's there certainly are significant new shadows cast on on Hoyt playground. So just wondering how you you know respond to concerns that this what is a, a really valuable open um, space resource in our community, um, how that could be limited to the the public by new shadows your project would cast over the site. Sure. So, um, so I'm just pulling out the uh, negative declaration that, that was issued by the Department of City Planning with, with respect to the environmental assessment statement uh, that was produced um, in connection with the rezoning. Um, you, you're correct. There, there is no significant adverse impact uh, from, from shadows cast uh, by the proposed development. Um, a, a detailed analysis was, was performed, um, which is included within the environmental assessment statement. Um, so while some shadows were, were, are, will be cast uh, on uh, portions of Hoyt Playground, um, they're not considered to be uh, significant adverse impacts, um, and then thus the negative declaration was issued. Um, that said, uh, the applicant team has um, been in contact with the Parks Department um, and had a meeting with the Borough Commissioner with respect to potential um, contributions either to maintenance or overall improvement of Hoyt Playground. Um, at this point, the, the um, conversation is essentially tabled pending, um, you know, potential approval of the rezoning. Um, and we look forward to continuing those conversations if, if development moves forward. Um, and we're happy to involve you in those conversations if, if you so choose to be involved. Yeah, that was going to be my next, uh, you know, question. In addition to, to parks, would you be willing to work with my office to identify a way to make sure that the public can get can maximum use? Um, from that? Absolutely. Yeah, we, I think we've had pretty production. I believe we've met had two, um, uh, their video meetings, but, but two meetings with, with parks. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of ready and willing to move forward. With those conversations and, and are obviously happy to include your office. Awesome. Um, and how much of the community facility space is being occupied by Hannock for the, the youth and senior programming? So um, in the uh, there's there's uh, three community facility spaces. Um, there's community facility space in, in each building. The southernmost site, development site one, um, has about 4,000 square feet of community facility space. Um, Hannock is not involved uh, or um, in that space. Uh, the intended tenant is a daycare. Um, moving northward to development site two, um, that is about, let me just give you the, uh, just shy of uh, 4,000 square feet. Um, that's the only community facility space in development site two, uh, and that's intended to be occupied by Hannock to provide senior programming. And then the third, uh, development has uh, two floors of community facility space. Um, the intention is that um, about 8,000 square feet of that community facility space uh, would be used by Hannock for youth programming, so either on the second or third floor. And then the other floor um, is intended to be occupied by uh, medical office uses um, as the, the community facility space in that building. Uh, thank you. And. Um... I, just one more question. The, the the community board mentioned the need for more, um, and it's obviously a concern of mine as well, uh, more and, and deeper affordability for this application. Would you be willing to work with my office to increase the number of affordable units in, within these projects? We're, we're happy to have that conversation. Um, it, you know, as, as we noted, we're, we're uh, working with uh, MIH option one. Um, and, but, you know, we're, we're happy to, to sit down and, and, and figure out what we can do with respect to affordability. Uh, with your office. Thank you for taking my questions. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you, Councilmember Kavan. Um, I want to just, I have a couple of questions, if, if I may, uh, Mr. St. Jacques. Um, um, the, can you just, uh, briefly walk us through how the community advisory board will work? Sure, so this was a, a condition um, and you know, part of discussion with the, uh, uh, the Queensborough president 
Um, we're still working out the details, but we, we've actually, um, you know, had several internal meetings. Um, I, I think, um, you know, sort of roughly uh, the intent is to engage staff uh, at the Queensborough President's Office, uh, involve the community board. Um, there is a neighborhood organization, uh, the 32nd Street Association, which we've been in contact with uh, and which we'll continue to be in contact with um, uh, to, to basically form the, the community advisory board. We would also ask uh, Council Member Caban uh, and her staff to be involved in forming that. Um, and, you know, beyond, uh, you know, sort of extending an invitation and, and uh, to membership, uh, uh, you know, through the community board, the borough president, and the local council member's office, um, you know, we, we haven't really gotten much, much farther, but I, I think the idea is to make it as inclusive and as productive as possible, such that the, um, the applicants, the local, um, uh, who own the three development sites, uh, we'll be able to have an ongoing and productive discussion with um, uh, the community about, you know, potential concerns and uh, responding to those concerns um, sort of on a, a real-time basis. Um, and can you speak to how, um, what your plan is to um, work with neighboring uh, low-density property owners to ensure that the construction on your sites will not make their lives unbearable during construction? Absolutely. So we, we've um, begun that conversation. We had uh, one meeting, I believe it was in uh, November by video. Um, and, you know, again, this is this is another ongoing conversation. Um, as we noted, there's there's a, um, you know, significant opportunity for as a right development at these sites. So were the rezoning not to go forward, there, there is an intent to, to uh, develop here. Um, so we, we understand that we, we, the applicant team needs to work with uh, their neighbors, um, you know, to ensure that that uh, construction goes smoothly. Um, the so I'll just say again, we we have been in contact with the 32nd Street uh, Homeowners Association to set up a follow up meeting. This would be an in person meeting. Um, uh, the the our contact at that group, I believe he's the, um, uh, the 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 chair or the head of that that group has asked um, for ample time to essentially flyer the neighborhood to make sure that, that folks that, you know, wouldn't otherwise be notified um, have sufficient time and notification of, of an upcoming meeting. So we're working out the details of that now and expect to meet either, I'm not sure if it'll be later in this month uh, or in, in early 2022, um, but we're working on that now. And also note, um, I, I think we, we touched on this in our letter to uh, the council and, and, and definitely in the letter to the community board um, there's really significant protections um, for adjacent property owners in um, the New York City Building Code. Um, so we'll, you know, obviously have to, to comply with um, all of those those uh, provisions in the Building Code. And as part of the um, environmental assessment statement and uh, negative declaration, um, restrictive declarations will also be recorded against each of the three properties. Uh, to ensure certain uh, protections are, are implemented with respect to construction noise and air quality. Um, the restrictive declaration also requires a third party environmental monitor uh, to not only ensure those protections are in place uh, before any construction starts, um, but also that they continue to be implemented and are effective uh, during uh, the entire um, construction process. Um, so we, we believe that there's, you know, between um, a commitment to ongoing uh, discussion and engagement with the community. Um, there's also several legal protections um, that are subject to enforcement uh, that, that you know, hopefully will, will ensure a, a smooth uh, construction um, uh, period. Thank you so much. Um, uh, those are all the questions that I have. Um, if um, any of my colleagues have any further questions, please use the raised hand function. Okay. Um, seeing none, um, uh, Council, do you have anything to add at this point? No, Mr. Chair, you okay. could dismiss the applicant panel. Okay, there thank being you. no further questions, thank you. The applicant panel is excused. Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 31st Street and Hoyt Avenue proposal? Yes. 
we have a number of advanced registrations for testimony and we will begin that testimony with Laura Picallo and Stephen Trillivas. Laura Picallo and Stephen Trillivas. Uh, Laura Picallo to go first. Starting time. I'll remind uh, all public witnesses to please accept any unmute request that you might see on your device in order to begin your testimony. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, city council members and especially city council member Caban as our nearest representative. Uh, we look forward to you representing our community's interests here in Astoria. The proposed rezoning for development on 31st Street and Hoyt Avenue is yet another affront to everything that is beneficial for Astoria. As someone who lives directly behind the proposed rezoning, I am disgusted. It is yet another case of a developer placing profits before the integrity of the neighborhood. This project is built to reinvigorate the area, but if you are actually from here, you know it is a fact quite active. I walk down 31st Street in Hoyt daily and it is far from desolate, which the developer would like you to believe. Is the developer here to make Astoria, to make sure that Astoria has adequate daycare, senior facilities or affordable housing, all of which can be built at the proposed site? Or are these rezonings here exclusively to pack more and more people into our trains, pack out and overflow our sewer system, pack out our schools and overwhelm our already stressed energy grid, as well as overburdening existing infrastructure. We can't keep pretending these sham affordable housing developments are either affordable or beneficial for Astoria. How can we continue to pack out the neighborhood without any changes to infrastructure, knowing fully well that the environment cannot handle it? It's almost criminal. Please ask yourself, what true value does this upzone bring to the people of Astoria? What real value does building more luxury units bring to this neighborhood? How many of these units will actually be affordable? Or does this rezoning solely develop, solely benefit the developer? Can we add to the community while not destroying the character of the community? Can we add these services while respecting the integrity of the area? Yes, we can. We can easily have HANIC daycare centers and shops at this exact site as it is zoned today without this upzone. Time expired. This is not a this or that. And as someone who is directly affected by this, I beg you to please reject this upzoning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Piccolo. Um, Council, can we call the next witness? Steve Trillivas to testify next. Mr. Trillivas, if you could accept any unmute request that you might see on your device in order to begin your testimony. I can see Steve Trillivas, I cannot. Hey, thank you guys. Starting time. Right, so my name's Steve Trillivas. I'm a homeowner on 32nd Street, uh, impacted by this development. Uh, I also have reluctantly taken up the mantle of being my elderly neighbor, neighbors who don't have the ability to uh, access these meetings. So uh, the three proposed sites along 30th Street have launched position from the local community for a number of reasons. You Mr. Chilovas, can I, can I just uh, interject for a second? Can you turn off your second device? We'll, we'll grant you back. Uh... I, uh, I do not have a second device. Oh. Okay, you're oh. you're on. There you are. Okay, okay. okay. We'll we'll uh, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll uh, credit you uh, twenty five seconds. Thank you. All right. So there were six hundred and seventy five signatures collected, four hundred and fifty supported, but only eight were in the neighborhood. Two hundred and twenty five opposed. One hundred and sixty two were in the neighborhood. As a consequence, we brought our case to the community board, and they voted against this in a mandate landslide twenty five to four. The general community is against this. If you read local resident feedback, you know, it's an eyesore. It doesn't fit with the architectural framework of the local community. The height of these buildings are not fitting with the local neighborhood framework. And there's a lot of, you know, reasons for that in terms of the people on 32nd Street. The block on 32nd Street is a plethora of houses that were built in 1930. They have delicate utilities made of terracotta. And in addition, most people that live in the block are octogenarians and pensioners. The development is directly on the property line of these buildings, especially site two and three, and will cause significant jam 
the backyards of the existing homes they abut against. In addition, 24th Road is the lifeblood of the ability of the house on 36th Street to move in and out of their homes as their parking spaces behind the houses. However, this will likely be used as the primary staging ground for construction logistics. Keep in mind, the impacted block is a dead end street and has limited access for the residents to get to their home. Uh, there's also an abundance of noise and pollution. While they might meet code requirements, will cause a great amount of distress to local residents who, you know, once again are at, in elderly. All right. As a result, there has been a mass panic of people selling their homes on the block to avoid the multi-year eight construction project, including the family, the parents of Luis Alvarez. Time expired. You might not know his name, but his face was the one, uh, like along with John Stewart, that was the face of the first responders in Congress. All right. And, and also, you have to keep in mind, Site 3 is in front of a, a public school, which will be severely impacted by the noise and traffic that is going to come in our neighborhood. So I ask the city council to vote against this and, and, and abide by the mandate that came from the community. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Trilivis. If, uh, Council, are there any uh, further members of the public to testify? There are additional members of the public, but this, uh, this that was the last speaker on this panel. Uh, so I don't know if there are council member questions for this panel. If not, we can go to the next panel. I have none, council. All right, with that, um, we can move on to the next panel, which will include Renzo Ramirez to testify first, followed by the Reverend Gilbert Pickett, then Nakia George and Victoria Kammer. Renzo Ramirez uh, to testify first. Mr. Ramirez, if you could accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. See you, we can uh, see you, but. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Levin and members of the subcommittee. My name is Renzo Ramirez and I am a member of 32BJ SEIU here on behalf of the more than 85,000 32BJ members to express our strong support of this project. The developers MDM development group have applied to build three new 11 and 14 story mixed use buildings that will include residential, commercial, and community space. We are pleased to announce that the developer has reached out early to make a credible commitment to providing prevailing wage jobs to the future building service workers at this site. We estimate that this rezoning will allow for the creation of new property service jobs and 72 new affordable units. These jobs are typically filled by local members of the community and because of this commitment, will pay family sustaining wages, which help bring working families into the middle class. These apartments are needed for working people in Queens. This commitment to good prevailing wage jobs will give opportunity for upward mobility, security, and dignity for working class families. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. We know that this development will continue to uphold the industry standard and provide opportunities for working families to thrive. Thank you so much for your time. We'll next hear from the Reverend Gilbert Pickett, followed by Nakia George. Starting time. Thank you so much. I am Pastor Gilbert Pickett, senior, the senior pastor of the Mount Horeb Baptist Church in Corona. And uh, even though I pastor in Corona, I have uh, a large percentage of my congregants who live in Western Queens. I am in support of the proposed 31st Street uh, rezoning project. We know that 31st Street has undergone a lot of construction that is not an eyesore uh, to that community. As the media past moderator of Eastern Baptist Association, which uh, is comprised of Brooklyn, Nassau, Suffolk, and the majority of our churches in Queens. Therefore, again, we have a lot of congregants who live in Western Queens. We know that this project 
will bring about affordable housing. We know that this project will bring about a senior center, a youth center, and a necessary uh, universal pre-K program. Uh, so it is very important uh, that we see this project go up as we know that this project, along with the others on 31st Street, uh, will not be an eyesore. And it is uh, unfortunate that uh, the homeowners uh, feel a certain kind of way, but we know that those homes will not depreciate uh, in value. Uh, who wouldn't want to live in New York City, especially in Queens? So those homes will not depreciate in value uh, after this beautiful uh, building has grown up, which will be beneficial uh, to the entire Western community. So I am in support of this groundbreaking effort and I hope this project uh, gets approved. Thank you so much. The next speaker will be Nakia George to be followed by Victoria Kammer. Ms. George, if you could accept the unmute request uh, before you begin your testimony. Starting time. Yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Nikia George, and I am a community advocate for Woodside Houses in Queens. Today, I would like to explain to you the importance of why I fully, fully support the proposed zoning map amendment and zoning tax amendment to facilitate new mixed use developments on 31st Street and Community District 1 Queens. The proposed development would include over 375 dwelling units. Out of those 375 dwellings, 100 of those units will be made permanently affordable. As mentioned earlier, all 100 new affordable housing units rents will be significantly less than the market rates for comparable units throughout the entire neighborhood. Additionally, allowing this change would ignite the birth of several new commercial locations to be developed and opened. Allowing commercial spaces to evolve will provide new career opportunities for everyone to access within the community. This zoning change has so many benefits for the public use. Additionally, this zoning change will beautify the section of 31st Street's corridor. To be plainly honest, this area has been undeveloped and rather neglected for many, many years. This portion of 31st Street, as opposed to the other portions of 31st Street, is much less attractive and less active. As a woman, I would not want to walk down this corridor alone at any time of the day, especially the nighttime. What I'm trying to say is the portion of 31st Street needs a facelift. The current dark and dangerous street will be reactivated, filled with light and abundance, providing a fresh new heartbeat to Astoria, giving it a place of life and resilience. I'm in full support of the proposed rezoning and I ask that everyone involved, whether for or against, to look deeper and to look into this proposal. We will all benefit once we all come together. I hope you listen to the words and you understand the importance of us taking the next step to do this development as a community together. Thank you for your time. And we will next hear from Victoria Kammer. Starting time. Hi, my name is Victoria Kammer and I'll be reading on behalf of Claudia Koger. Um, she was on earlier, but she had to jump off. So I'll be reading a letter on her behalf. My name is Claudia Koger and I have been a resident of Astoria Houses for over 60 years and the president of the Astoria Houses Resident Association. I am a tireless advocate for social welfare education and tenants right in the Astoria community. As an advocate for my community, I speak today in support of the 31st rezoning as it will provide our residents with new facilities and resources, including a youth and senior center. The youth center will provide much needed space for recreation and will be open to the community at large. The youth center will promote social interaction, volunteerism and civic pride while providing opportunities for young residents to be active and interact with other residents. The developer has already demonstrated their support for Astoria Houses and supported this year's Family Day. Their proposed work with Hannock to create programming that best serves Astoria's needs is more than promising. This development will turn underutilized, underutilized land into a community resource that will immediately be immediately accessible to the people it will house and the seniors and children it will serve. Please accept this testimony as my support for the rezoning. Thank you for your time and consideration. And just one additional, I know I only have a few seconds left, but. Um, Annie Cotton Morris is also unable to make it today. And I do have a letter which will be sent, um, but I would also just like to express my support on her behalf as the president of the Woodside Resident Association and also the president of the Queenswide um, President for NYCHA. She's a community leader and you know, in her letter, she discusses how much she supports this project and the need for public housing in Western Queens. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levin, the last speaker on this panel. And we will now check to see whether there are, uh, uh, if there are no questions for this panel uh, from council members. We will now see if there are any other members of the public wishing to testify. Uh, for any members of the public uh, remaining who have not yet testified and who do wish to do so on 31st Street and White Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. Once again, for anyone who has not already testified uh, and intends to do so on 34th, 31st Street and Hoyt Avenue, please use the raise hand button now. Okay, Chair Levin, uh, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Oh, excuse me. All right, I see. We had somebody there for a second and then they disappeared. So maybe we'll just wait a second to see if we get, if they want, if they're coming back on. If they've come back in. Anyone who is currently logged in as Victoria Kammer and uh, um, has not yet testified, please use the raise hand. Okay, I see uh, an individual there uh, with, I guess, a different login. Uh, so we will now uh, hear from uh, one additional speaker who is currently logged in as Victoria Kammer, who we know not to be Victoria Kammer. Please state your name for the record and. Uh, you can begin after we need you to accept the unmute request. Okay. All right. Starting time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Please. I had a little problem. Can Please you do me? state your name. Uh, just state your full name for the record and then. <clears throat> My name is Bishop Mitchell G. Taylor. And I am reading this letter on behalf of, well, first of all, to the committee and everyone that's here, Council Member Caban, congratulations on. Uh, being seated yesterday. Uh, I'm reading this letter on behalf of Reverend Bobby Moore, uh, the overseer of the Astoria Baptist Church located at 31-1721st Street in Long Island City, New York. Uh, I would like to express my unwavering support for the 31st Street rezoning. I am in favor of this rezoning because I believe it will support the local employment and boost our local economy. This project will provide construction jobs that will be available to the community as well as permanent building service jobs. The developer has committed to working with Urban Upbound to ensure local hiring and fill the various positions with residents living in the existing community. Additionally, the developer will provide space and resources to do local job training and placement. They are also committed to using MWBE suppliers and contractors and subcontractors throughout the construction phase once the project begins. Additionally, the developer has committed to work with Hannock to build a youth and senior center and fund intergener intergenerational programming. Please support the request of the rezoning of this property as we support it. Thank you in advance for your support. And I'm reading that letter on behalf of Reverend Bobby Moore, the overseer of the Astoria Baptist Church in Astoria, Queens. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Taylor. Nice to see you. Likewise. Um, um, and okay. Um, are there any other uh, members of the public who wish to testify at this time? Okay, Chair, we'll ask one, one last time for any members of the public who have not already testified and who wish to testify on 31st Street and Hoyt Avenue rezoning to please use the raise hand button now. All right, Chair, I see no other members of the public who wish to, to, to testify on this item. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Kaban, do you have anything that you would like to add? I don't, uh, I don't I know how to unmute. Oh, I couldn't unmute, I couldn't initially couldn't unmute myself. Um, no, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so there being no further members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered land use items for the 31st Street and Hoyt Avenue proposal under ULERP numbers C, 
210200ZMQ and N210201ZRK. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Um, now, Council, do we have any, any further votes to take? Any members of the committee that are wish to vote? Okay. Um, so with that, uh, this concludes today's business. I will remind the viewing public that for anyone wishing to submit written testimony for items that were heard today, please send it by email to land use testimony, all one word, land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is land use testimony, all one word, at council.nyc.gov. I would like to thank all the members of the public, my colleagues in particular, my new colleague, Council Member Tiffany Caban, uh, subcommittee, council, land use, and other council staff, and the sergeant at arms for participating, sergeants at arms for participating in today's hearing. Uh, this hearing is adjourned.